The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. Becoming a member at Navy Federal can help you earn more and save more. You can learn all about this at NavyFederal.org. Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please hit that like and subscribe button if you like to see the shows. So today, before we kick it off with our special guest, let's get to our weekly Patreon question. This week, we have got, what does your typical morning routine look like? Are you kidding me? That's the question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I would say mine uh, varies quite a bit because I'm on the road quite a bit. So you still a lot all on the, the road time. all the time. All the time, man. Like usually about three to five flights a week. I mean, a great week would be just two flights, but I try to press hard between like around end of January till Fourth of July, and then I try to kind of not travel so much until because a lot of people are on vacation in summer till august and then press all the way hard until mid-december and then i try to go mid-december mid-january like not travel so what are you doing do you do you have morning routine then for all that um basically get up and start running like uh i mean because sometimes i get in real late at night or whatever so really just get it get up you know jump in the shower grab some coffee and i just start working um i think i know a lot of people have maybe their zen time in the morning i just get going so You'll, you'll get there. Yeah. I think we, uh, well, eventually I'll always wind up there. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, I get up, if it's during the week, I get up and get the kids ready and just get them ready for school and see them out because you take them to school. And I like to walk them out, watch them get in the car and wave them off, tell yeah. them I love them and have a great day. And then I go back and lay down for a minute. <laughs> what are you doing? I typically like to, I guess, wake up around seven, go hit the gym, and then once I get done with that, just hop on the computer, start doing some work. Other than that, pretty pretty simple, easy going. Yeah. I get up every morning at five thirty, no questions asked. I either sit up out of bed or our two labs wake me up. It's amazing. They don't even need an alarm clock. They're just they they wake me up. I go feed the dogs. The first thing I do when my feet hit the ground is I say, I will serve. Then I walk them out. I put food in their bowl. I th- and then I open up the door, let them back in. I hit the shower. I do all my morning prayers, like everything, put on the armor, say this whole, I have this whole routine I say in there. Come back out of there, go into the living room, sit down for 20 minutes and do nothing but breathing. I have this app that I listen to and I do nothing but breathe. Ooh, nice. And then that puts me right on track to wake the kids up. My daughter likes to be up at a specific time. She's real particular about that. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> she likes to wake up early. That's so awesome. I go rouse the kids, and then I come back downstairs. I sit down, and I get my first cup of coffee. Yeah. It's right after 7 around there, and I don't drink coffee. It's in the, before 7 or after 10. Okay. It's like it's weird. I got after this. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, <laughs> she gets up. She goes up and, f- and finishes getting the kids ready. Yeah. Then we all come downstairs. It's easy to do breakfast, or we'll load up. I'll have, I'll pull the truck around. Yeah. And then I like taking the kids to school in the morning. That's yeah. my thing. That's I mean, awesome. I, I, I be here, I, and then I, if I have to leave, fine. But then I'll come back at the end of the day because I always want to be there in the morning. Yeah. I take them to school. I come back, park the car, grab the dogs, and then I go for a two and a half mile walk and say my rosary every morning. That's awesome. And then I come back and meet Mel, and then we go for another two and a half hour or two mile walk. Or That's a bike great. ride or something. Yeah. Come back. About that time puts me on track for working out. Yeah. Then I hit the gym. They say if you can make it till 10 a.m., man, if your day's good, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a diner. I go meet all the town elders, <laughs> sit at. Yeah. They're all in there. Yeah. And I go hang out in there sometimes. Shout yeah. out, Kitties. Yeah. It's Miss, Miss Kitties is the name of the place. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, yeah. That's every morning. Every that's morning. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. And if I'm on the road doing the traveling, I back it up. You back it up? I back it up. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a great morning routine. It took me a while to get yeah. into it. Like yeah. It was baby steps. Right. Because I'm not a morning person, so to... But I think, like, like you know, I used to try to, like, get up and do, like, a big hard workout in the morning, and I would just feel horrible. Mm-hmm. And so, like, uh, I think just getting up in the morning... And I could do easy cardio, like a walk or something. My body just doesn't feel like it kind of comes online until about three to four hours past the time I wake up. I'm like, oh, I finally... 
I think that's part good. of life, man. Yeah. That's why you got to get the new. It, those mornings are great. Yeah, I mean, you get more good. done in the morning when you're out there. Right. But, yeah. Everyone says that it's true. The air feels better. The air feels better. Yeah. I like to walk around my garden too because I'm a, a garden nerd. But uh, <sighs> when Marcus is dropping the kids off, I I'll walk around and like check on all of my plants. Like, yeah. See if there's any new blooms, any yeah. new veggies coming yeah. popping out or whatever I'm growing. Yeah. Out in um, nature. It's like my. Yeah. I'm checking in with everything that's growing and making sure it's yeah. doing good. Yeah. I, I'm usually uh, uh, checking uh, the traffic uh, wherever I am. Oh, I have the background <laughs> on too. I do that too. Yeah. And then, because uh, a lot of times I'm traveling city to city and then I don't know, and this is like hit me sometimes. I, I think I'm going to be able to get from point A to point B like pretty quick and like traffic. And I, you know, I didn't realize traffic in that area was that bad. And sometimes it's like middle of the day or something, you know, so... I'm usually kind of traveling, checking tra traffic patterns. And now I've gotten better. I try to do a ad von and talk to all of my clients. I'm like, okay, if I'm coming from here to here, you know, how much time will I sure. have? And they'll be like, oh, you know, like, yeah. I was just, people yeah. get a lot done now. Yeah. Stuck in those. Yeah. Stuck in the, yeah. If you're, if you can like do, they call it something, windshield something. I can't remember what the name of that is, <laughs> yeah. but if you get jammed up like that, that's yeah. when that tech really comes into play. Yeah, tech comes into play, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if I can ever take a train, like, uh, I think the first time I ever took a train was with you guys. Oh, really? Yeah, on Patriot Tour in 2014. Yeah, on the East Coast, right? Yeah, yeah, because we did planes, trains, and automobiles. I mean, we hit, we I did. think we even did a bus. We did. Yeah. We did do a bus. Yeah, we did do yeah, a bus, we right? we one year where we had a bus. <laughs> yeah, so that was like the first time I took a train. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, this is so peaceful right isn't it great yeah and then like uh I've t if i can take a train sometimes like you can get on sometimes they have wi-fi or like a uh deal and you can just get out on there and knock out so much work so between la and san diego i've taken that train so many times oh i've done that yeah and it's a beautiful it's so much better than the traffic. driving in the traffic yeah, for yeah. there's something peaceful san about it when you're the sound it makes when it's walking past through there yeah. the scenery is changing constantly yeah it's quiet it's quiet. i always get on the quiet car yeah like you, yeah. which is self-explanatory <laughs> yeah <laughs> just enjoy the train right yeah you're not battling traffic right yeah. and all that stuff but uh yeah that's that's a great morning routine i think i would like if i was going to add something to my morning routine i like to just get up and i think walk a lot of times in a hotel or whatever walk on the treadmill walk on something kind of clear my mind if you can walk outside i think that's in nature that's ideal and then uh, you go i mean sometimes when i'm in new york for meetings I might walk three to four miles a day between, you know, you can go 0. Yeah. 0.6 miles this way, 0. 0.8 miles that, meaning da 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 da, you know, and then it depends how hot it is, how much uh, calories. Somebody needs to take the job description and figure out how the job actually has workouts inside of it yeah. and exploit <laughs> right. that. So when you're yeah. doing the job, you're like, oh, I'm going to the gym in the yeah. morning and I'm delivering this, but I'm actually getting my steps in here. Yeah. And when I do this, I'm doing my upper body. Yeah. Put on, yeah, wear ankle weights. The new guru. Yeah, the new guru, right? It's like, this is how I'm going to teach you how to work out in your job. Yeah, 10,000 steps with 20-pound ankle weights. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. so funny. Okay, so our guest today, Mr. Billy Wagasi. Hello, everybody. We are so excited to have you on. Yeah, um, excited to be here. So for the uh, for our guest, Billy Wagasi was part of our Patriot Tour that we used to have from 2013. Uh, 14 2014 yeah. to 2018 yeah and um those were some really busy years but they yeah. were really fun Super and there's fun. a lot of great memories so many from great. those and yeah. uh even hunter was a little kid on yep. the tours when he didn't have school he would come with us and uh he got to experience it as well yeah yeah, and Hunter, you were like the most well-behaved kid ever. <laughs> can you believe that? How lucky yeah. I got with that, bro? Yeah, like that was this, incredible. Uh, can you believe it? Yeah, he was. I mean, the most polite. Thank you, God, dude. Most polite, most well-behaved kid. It was good. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, this was, was a pretty awesome experience. <laughs> it was awesome. If, so I always tell people, talking about different team guys, that you are so different from so many. I mean, a lot of them. A lot of guys aren't, uh, they don't have like a, a niche All or whatever. Right, what's that stereotype that we the, have yeah, on it's us? Not a okay, so here's the deal. There's You said this earlier. I was yeah, curious. I, there's I a, heard this. There's a stereotype. I don't know. There's a stereotype yeah. that seals come from broken families yeah. or specifically like a really hard dad or an absent dad. Okay. And I have always debunked that yeah. based off of your story, my story. because <laughs> you have such a loving family. Yeah. Super sweet. Yeah. And dad's a dentist. Like yeah. crazy suburbanite American, Americana family, right? Yeah. I just, yeah. And my, where'd you come from? 
So I was born and raised in Springfield, Missouri. So, like uh, uh, Simpsons territory? Uh, yeah, I don't think they ever say like which Springfield the Simpsons are from uh, because there's like 25 in, oh, in the I country, right? Yeah, because yeah, they got a Springfield, Massachusetts, Springfield, Illinois. But like we're famous for Bass Pro Shops. How then, great is that story? Yeah, that's great, uh, man. Incredible. That man right there yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah, he is, man. Johnny Morris, we need Johnny you Morris is yeah. on the podcast. Unbelievable <laughs> man. Yeah, you guys should get him on the podcast. He's uh, I, I can't even. This is there's a couple of stories I can't walk into. Yeah, because if I go in there, I'm yeah. gonna come out with a pair of gloves I don't need. Yeah. You know, four more hats and some a boat. Fish, yeah. A boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something to haul the boat with, probably. Yeah. Thank you. You know that those kind of. <laughs> There's certain stories. The smell when you walk in right. there just smells like you want to buy yeah. something. And I remember when I was a little boy walking into Bass Pro, like when I was, you know, like five, six, seven, and I thought it was huge then, right? And now what it's out there now because they just kept building and adding on as as uh, Bass Pro shops have gotten bigger. But yeah, it's incredible. And me and Johnny, uh, you and, know them, right? Uh, well, me and Johnny were inducted into the Springfield Hall of Fame in 2016 together. Congratulations! Uh, thank you. With another. Uh, uh, fellow person, we all had gone to the same high school, so it was Glendale High School in Springfield, Missouri. So you know that him and the doctor had just gone, you know, years before me or whatever. But uh, Johnny was so he was just so funny and so uh, charitable that whole weekend. He's you know, extremely charitable, extremely charitable, and we just had a super fun time. I don't so. think that word can even apply to him, man. Yeah. He, he's he's graduated from charity. Oh, he's just a freaking solid guy. Yeah, whatever whatever is yeah. up there at that <laughs> top yeah, whatever they a new word for that man. Yeah. He's freaking, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's good. And yeah. the uh so Springfield, Missouri was the first that's the flagship store of Bass Pro. Yeah, that's the flagship yeah. store. It's like and I tell everybody if they're going through Springfield, Missouri, go they, in there. Go I go, it's worth a, the stop. I mean it's huge because the museum is attached to it. Yeah. And an aquarium. It, yeah, and they got a great restaurant in there and uh it's and I know what everyone's thinking. Yeah. You're thinking redneck. Yeah. Uh -uh. I'm thinking is, the same. I, yeah. I got you. This but is, when you walk into this thing. This yeah. is Disney, Disney's version yeah. of outdoor fact, If you ever wanted to, to know what it was like to, to be able to walk underwater. Yeah. And see what the animals look like in their yeah. habitat. He's created that. Because yeah. you're walking through the aquariums, right? Yeah. He has an albino croc and uh, alligator in there. Yeah. I've been. I've been uh, the groupers. He's got, yeah. He's got so many things. I mean. I remember when they put the first big aquarium in there we're a little kid like the whole town was like you got to go to bass produce you know and now he's done like 10 20 times oh, that it's huge. you know it's huge hunter yeah. do you remember that yeah i do yeah. hunter flew from thailand that sounded convincing <laughs> hunter flew from thailand to springfield missouri to meet us there no way <laughs> that was the longest travel experience of my life i think i was in the plane or airports for 36 hours straight oh man you probably didn't know what day it was no like, i mean i patterns just, all i got to missouri and then i mean i was dead is that what we said a big cedar yeah big cedar yeah, yeah. what a great place oh it was hilarious yeah. 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 Woke up the next, that's right didn't you get sick yeah he, he <laughs> you blamed on your brother didn't you <laughs> yeah <laughs> i did that's right i think i just recently found that out too somebody let that one slide i, I mean bro it was a good i don't know it, it, i still think it could have been him you yeah. know what's funny axe actually brought that up last night he said you know i threw up a lot in springfield missouri but it might have been Bubba, yeah. and I was like, "Uh huh." It, uh, we, we both never blamed know that one on each other. Bed, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's a long flight, boy. Family. Yeah. Right? What are you gonna do? <laughs> but for anyone that is just needs a vacation, yeah, Big Cedar Lodge in Springfield, Missouri, and oh. we're not getting paid for this. I'm just telling you, yeah. it is one of the best family vacations. Like if you love Life John Candy heaven. movies, yeah. If you if you love John Candy movies, yeah. 80s movies, yeah, yeah. great outdoors and that, there yeah, you go. Yeah. <laughs> if you like that kind of feel, yeah, and you're in the you're just like a new dad, you're kind right. of starting out, or you're yeah. an older dad and you're hating life, whatever, yeah. it's everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. Freaking give it a try, man. Oh yeah. It'll, the lake, oh. and they got the boats. It's just it's like whatever you wanted to do out there. He could, yeah. he thought of it. Bowling, yeah, everything. Bowling. The, go oh, the go karts look like NASCARs for God's yeah. sake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he's a big NASCAR guy. So yeah, it's uh, I grew up on that lake, and yeah, it's just beautiful. A lot of wonderful memories there. The weather too, man. Yeah, weather's you know nice. Uh, uh, it's uh, he, yeah. how many brothers and sisters? I got one one sister. So That's she's right. just got done running boston for the 12th time wow uh in a row yeah i mean she sometimes puts in 70 to 100 miles a week i mean it's pretty intense and uh so but yeah kudos to my sister amy she just got done running do y'all uh, compete boston. a lot 
<clears throat> no, no. Dude, we, she, we always she, did. she kind of sounds like a badass. Dude. No, she's, she's a badass. Yeah. No, I'm not going to compete with her in running whatsoever. Like, uh, um, she got that one. She got that genetic. Yeah, that's what check. happened. To Mo- Mojo got that genetic. Yeah, Mojo bro. got that one. Yeah. Not yeah. me. No, it's, yeah. And so she did that. And what's interesting is the first time she ever did Boston was the year uh, of the bombings. And okay, that, was, yeah. that was the first public event I ever went to when I got out of the SEAL teams. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that day when I went there, because I was up in, uh, living in Catskill, New York at the time. And uh, I went there. You were boxing, right? Yeah, I was boxing. Yeah, I was like, or, or thinking I was boxing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shout out to Mike Tyson. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. I was. Uh, yeah. He has a fight coming up. Yeah, he's got a fight coming up. Yeah, that's gonna be incredible. I'm gonna try to get some people and head out. How there about that guy, it. man? We were blessed oh. growing up, man. We got the Michael generation. Oh my gosh, All watching right. those fights. Boston bombing. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Oh, so I remember walking around that because you know I could talk to Mike Tyson. Fi- oh yeah, yeah. we're I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that day, I remember walking around because it was my first public event, right? Like, I mean, I'd been out to restaurants and stores, but like my mass first mass public event since coming from the SEAL teams. And I remember I was kind of like in frogman mode, walking around, and I was like looking at people, and then looking at the, you know, like looking at the ground, looking at backpacks, looking at different things, you know, just like when we would patrol in you know Ramadi or whatever you're like always trying to see something that's a little out of place and everything like that I remember having a conversation with myself like hey hey wags you're you're in America just chill your sisters run the Boston Marathon it's a great day enjoy the day so I did so and then she finished about 45 minutes before the bombings went off and like and then they kind of go into this warming tent because I remember that day was kind of chilly so she went to this warming tent, and then we were going to walk back to where we were staying, which is over there in Cambridge. And then I, we stopped in a hotel because she was getting chilled again. So then we got her some hot tea. And while we were in that hotel, I think it was like um, the Copley Hotel or whatever, you, you felt the the building shake twice, and everyone's kind of looking around. So it was a good pop? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a big pop. I mean, you, it was like it was, when we were in Ramadi. Remember yeah. those times when that stuff would go? Right, but not not as intense as that. This, this was like you could, you could kind of hear and feel a little vibration, but it wasn't like as big as the... The, you knew what it was, the right? bids, right? Yeah, I was hoping against hope that it, like there were some, you know, cranes or whatever. I was hoping to hope something fell down, you know. But my gut was telling me like that was pro- that was a bomb, mm-hmm. right? Because I didn't hear it. I you, I didn't hear it so much. You heard a little bit, but then da da. And so everybody in the hotel lobby and restaurant were kind of like waiting, da da, to hear something. And then it comes across, you know, the uh, the the bar lounge uh, and restaurant TVs. lounge TVs. You know, so then, you know, then all these, you know, then the first responders start coming and everything. And then we just walked back to our hotel, you know. Um, but it was just like, it was such kind of like a surreal moment because I, you know, we just got, you you think like, uh, what what I realize now is, you know, like, you know, life and, and you know, the, the, the troubles and the hardships of life, they always will be there throughout your whole life, right? right. Like just everything. But sometimes when you go to war for a while, like, uh, and then you come back, you think like, okay, well, I'm, I'm in a new chapter, right? And then, well, and then that not. happened. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, here's the deal: it's yeah. like we are in a new chapter, but we're in the yeah. same book, okay? right? So, what happens is, is like, hey, man, you you did right. Yeah. Like, calm down, relax, enjoy the city. It's just everyone else is dealing with their stuff, right? And when you said we were trying to look what was out of place when we were in Mahdi, yeah, we were out of place. Yeah, we were out of place. That's a good trying point. to find out what was out of place where we wouldn't even belong right? right i remember that talk that when we had to go through all that yeah and it was like yeah because you were trying to see like as your uh because a lot of times when people were dropping like the ieds or whatever they'd be in a rice bag or they'd be in a backpack or they'd mean something and so you're just uh you know or they'd be you're you're trying to you, you, you know imagine that. yeah and you're you're just trying to always i mean think about our eod guys when they're that's why those guys get so spooked sometimes yeah. like when they say that that's a thing it is for some of our guys because yeah. they hide that stuff in everything right mm-hmm. yeah and they, and they and they would also walk with it on their back and stuff like right. that. so that's why a lot of our guys it takes a, a while and i don't think you de- it's kind of like a desensitization to it like yeah you, you just eventually it just becomes a part of you right the hyper awareness kind of goes away you're yeah. just doing it to it's like a routine yeah it's it's a routine and, and you're going through it i mean yeah so it's just uh yeah, but I mean that was uh, an incredible day, and I mean the were your you know, parents out there? No, my parents uh, weren't out there, but my brother-in-law was out there with us, and you know, so I mean, shout out to all the first responders. I mean, they, yeah, they did great. They did great. They showed up, and um, and and to uh, uh, everybody, you know, and, everybody. And hey, felt, that, you know, Boston, Boston strong. PD. Oh man, yeah. We, there was I, another... Remember how much fun we had up there with them? Yeah. Oh yeah, we had a great time. Dude, they were awesome. The PD picked us up. Yeah. And the fire department knew we were in town, and they yeah. took us. 
Yeah. If you want to see a city, yeah, hook up with them. <laughs> yeah. Is that Boston? Yeah. Yeah. Remember we went around the harbor? Oh yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they went to the, the baseball harbor. game. Yeah. I mean, yeah. In, in New York, they took care of us there. Yeah. DC police, Philadelphia, they could, did Philadelphia. It too. all of them. Oh yeah. all man, we're so great. Yeah. When so that world, they don't even Indianapolis. Yeah. Huge shout out to when Indianapolis. they want to show a person a good time. Yeah. And you yeah. want to see people get out of like, there's nothing in your way. Right. Yeah. When they did, when they open up and start doing their thing, it's the most yeah. impressive thing I've ever seen. Yeah, man. it is, man. Hats off to America yeah. for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so what does your dad do? <clears throat> so my dad was a, a dentist, and uh, now he's retired. Now he's a what did he do? Uh, he was a dentist. Your dad's for, a dentist, yeah. man. <laughs> so my brother-in-law's a dentist, and then uh, my my sister's a physical therapist. My mom was a, a a nurse, and so my whole family's in the medical field except for me. So, um, and then my dad's a woodworker now, and makes furniture and you know is just like, for the house or no just for or for mean, the neighbors yeah for, the, for, for, <laughs> for anybody who needs i made furniture. you a new couch <laughs> yeah he likes making wood tables like stuff like this and cool stuff yeah he just made me really uh cool table with uh like it with a portal on it like a like you got on a ship put there and they put like a map of oh, the nice. old world on it and then he emblazoned the navy seal trident on oh it. he's real good yeah yeah oh, wow. so it was really cool yeah. how cool yeah. Okay, so no military in the immediate family? Uh, no, I have an uncle that was in the military for a little while, like out in, I, like, you know, I think like stationed in, in Okinawa when he was okay, young. So what did you grow up like doing? I uh, just grew up um, all, you know, I, I feel like I had kind of like the, um, just a wonderful upbringing, all American upbringing. I mean, you know, we basically, you know, my parents worked hard. I, w I went to school, played sports, played football. Uh, my dad coached me. I, I mean, I played. See, see big guy? Yeah, he's like. Uh, he's he's like uh my all my friends called him the Viking. Uh, now yeah, that usually means big. Yeah, now he looks like Santa Claus. You know, he's got a huge. That's beard. even better. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and then so he but when he he was like five eleven two sixty. That's big. Yeah, like with a that's what that means nineteen and a half like inch. Like a Billy Shelton. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a big. That's what big means. Yeah. Them guys right yeah. there. Yeah, with his arms is like as big as most people's thighs. You see them dudes walking around <laughs> that particular size. They got something with them. It's yeah, usually not the dentist. Yeah, it's usually like not that. the dentist. Yeah, you ride a Harley. Yeah, no, he doesn't. But you know what's so funny that you say that is, uh, one time he's picking me up from uh, basketball practice, and then the coach had never met my dad. And so my dad's coming in his workout gear, you know, with like a kind of like a cut off sweatshirt and jogging pants and stuff with like a weight belt around him and. And uh, he's oh, like, that's nice. Yeah, and, he, and he's just standing. <laughs> Did you hear what he just said? Yeah, just, <laughs> just standing there in the on the corner, you know. And the, the some of the coaches were like wondering, like, who this guy is, you know. And then like afterwards, he goes, "Billy, I thought you said." I go, "Oh, no, that's my dad." He goes, "I thought you said he was a dentist." I go, "He is. He's a dentist." He goes, "Oh my gosh, I thought he was like a Harley, a Harley right? like rider." A biker. Yeah, yeah, like a biker. <laughs> <laughs> I see that a lot with those dentists, man. They look freaking rough when they're on their bikes, run through stairs. Like, man, dude, looks like a killer. What do you do? And no dentist, <laughs> you know something crazy, right? You're like, what? So oh, that is man. so funny. It is funny. Where's your mom and dad? They uh, they grew up together. Yeah, dad's originally from Detroit and grew up in uh, Lima, Ohio. My whole my grandpa came over and worked. My great grandpa in the Ford factories. I knew him. He died when I was about ten. Nice. Yeah, and then uh, so he came over from Hungary, like on the line. Yeah, like on the line and stuff. Like w one of those American stories of people coming yeah. over and then working up in the Ford factories. And I mean, like in 1915. I always thought like that, that that's a bit of nostalgia in me, especially yeah. with the American nostalgia. Yeah. Is that Detroit is kind of where our cars were made? Yeah, yeah right. So I, I forget what you, I think he came over in 1910 and probably started working on the line whenever they started the Ford. Eleven you know, or something. Yeah, right after that. I forget when they did it, but then. Uh, and then my grandpa, who died when I was two, so my great grandpa, you know, died when I was about ten. Um, he worked in the Ford factories as well. And my dad was the first one in his family to go to college. Wow! So and, you had a you had a school. skip. You what? had a father and a great grandfather. You didn't have a granddad. No, he, he no. Both my granddads. One granddad died died before I was born, and the other one died when I was two, two. Right? Yeah, two years old. Young. And, he died young. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. But knew my great grandpa. I mean, I remember him talking with like a real heavy Hungarian accent, you know, and uh, really nice. And then, uh, and my great grandma, she probably passed away when I was like in my teenage years. Like, uh, and then, um, uh, yeah. So they were, lived up there in uh, Romulus, uh, Michigan, near Detroit. And then uh, my dad, they moved when they built a Ford plant in Lima, Ohio. My dad moved down there. And then uh, my mom was from Cleveland, so I got this. She's from a huge Catholic family, so like. I like have cousins and probably second and third cousins all over Cleveland. And she grew up in Parma, Ohio, you know, and then my dad got into, 
uh, went to college at um, uh, Southwest Missouri, which is now Missouri State. And then that's how kind of we ended up in Springfield. Nice. Yeah. So when you were growing up, you just wanted to play football? Yeah, pretty much. You know, like, that's what my dad loved to do, you know, and he loved uh, football. So then I just kind of mimicked him and, you know, kind of fell in love with watching football and stuff. And right, this is my friend. This is where it gets yeah. good with you, man. Yeah. So you went to college to play football? Yeah. But what's kind of funny is because he was from Detroit. I grew up loving Michigan because we watched all the Michigan football games, right? Yeah. And uh, he loved I feel like that entire area has to hang around Michigan. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. That's like if you're from Detroit, you're like a diehard. Boom. You know, right yeah. there, yeah. Yeah. But then when. Um, Hardball boys. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, congrats to all, all the Michigan fans. It was a lot of fun. And then I, and then when recruiting started for football, um, like M Michigan didn't recruit me a lot, but a lot of other schools did, and so I ended up going to Notre Dame. You know, so his mom's a Catholic. She loved that. <clears throat> oh yeah, she loved it. My parents loved Notre Dame. I love Notre Dame. <clears throat> it was an incredible, incredible experience. Even just going up. What there. year was this? Isn't Rudy was big? <clears throat> no, you know what's funny? Have you met him? Uh, um, yeah, he wouldn't remember me or anything, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. That's, that's that's. <laughs> I, we know how this works now, but but he's around, right? Yeah, yeah, he's around. Yeah. So, but I remember. Um, like uh, Coach Holtz would come to practice and he would tell the story of Rudy. This is before the movie was ever made or anything. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they're like, they're going to make a movie about this. And I was like, I go, they're not. I was like, think to myself, no one's going to make a movie about, <laughs> you know, this or whatever. And the next thing I know, they start filming the movie while we're there. That's what I want to ask yeah. you that, man. I was like, I guess they're making a movie. I'm like, what do I know? I'm a college kid, right? You know Vince Vaughn's yeah. in that movie, yeah, too? Yeah, Vince Vaughn's in that movie. Yeah. I didn't that know is, that. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, he He's is. on the team. Yeah, he plays the uh, quarterback. That, so like, is Favre. Uh, tailback. All, man, yeah. man, all the great actors yeah. and directors. That whole that whole crew, man. Yeah, they did a great job with that movie. That's a really special It's a go-to. Yeah, it's a go-to. So he was your coach. Uh, my coach was uh, Coach Holtz. So, uh, he, Coach Holtz, who uh, still going strong, and Lou, Coach Lou Holtz. Coach Lou Holtz. I got to have dinner with him one time. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. So, man, that being under him for five years, <clears throat> one, one of the one of the greatest things I can say about him is like, there's a few things. Number one, he brought an intensity and a passion every single day for five years that I was there. He never. There was never a day that you were under his tutelage where he had an off day or where he, gotcha. where, where he wasn't like locked on and, and bringing that type of intensity every single day to practice, to push the team, to do everything. And, uh, you know, and we're all like young kids and like, I mean, like, so you, when you came to practice, man, you were like, uh, <laughs> you were ready to go. Right. I mean, what you, were some of the things that you like just it ingrained in your livelihood of what he taught you? Um, it, it's you know, we, we had three rules at uh, at Notre Dame, like or you know, kind of three kind of values. Like, you know, uh, Coach Holt says talks about this, like when he talks, he's like, you know, do what's right. It's not right to find your teammate's wallet before he loses it. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> and, and then he would. Uh, That's pretty good. Yeah. And then do your best and show people you care, but um, do what right is you know pretty straightforward. Show people you care and do your best means like bringing that same intensity that he's bringing. That's what he means, right? And a lot of people are like okay, just show people you care. No, the way you show people you care is if you're part of a team and you're part of a a, a family or whatever you're doing. You have to put forth incredible effort and mental focus and everything like that to do your best in every single facet and echelon of whatever you're doing from your preparation to your execution uh to all these things so it's like it's like not like showing people you care like hey hope you have a great day it's it's meaning like you're adding value to whatever group you're doing because you care and in in, in, a, in a big way right and so that's one of the biggest thing the biggest things i learned from him is like every day you got to bring it and you got to bring it with that high intensity level and uh, and that's that's really hard to do. I mean, that's it's incredibly hard, incredibly to do. hard to do. And, uh, and most people don't know that that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, we, you and I were having this conversation last night. You got one day. Yeah. One day. One freaking day in one here. One day. Yeah. So when you get up in the morning, if you knew that you were going to die when you laid down, how yeah. hard would you go? And, and right. you can't get out of what day you're in. Right. Yeah. We're not saying like, what would you do? What would you do? Right. We're saying in your day, this is one you got. This yeah. is what you got to deal with. Yeah. What are you going to do in it? Right. Yeah. And, and that, and that's what, um, I, I've heard coach Holtz tell the story. This predates my time at Notre Dame, but like when they lost, I, th I think it was the, um, 
in the orange bowl or whatever. And he goes, he goes, I go in the locker room and one person was crying. And I wasn't on the team at this time. And he goes, and that person didn't even play. And I think it was Chris Orridge. And then coach Holt said, um, uh, he goes, uh, coach Holt said, I made a decision right then and there that we were going to put on the football team, people like him who, you know, cared about, you know, winning and mm-hmm. losing and cared about our mission here. Yeah. You don't you know? think about that. Yeah. But when you look in the stands and you see the fans crying when their boys lost, yeah. think about what that means. Yeah. It means you, you care. They, they care enough to where that right. physically and emotionally bothered them. Right. And, and that's, uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's doing your best every single day, showing people you cared. And that's what you knew about Holtz. Like, uh, he, he lives those three rules and he lives them in the top, echelon of the way that you can live them like doing your best every single day and uh and you know it's it's like you know you you see companies who are on the fortune 500 or the dow 30 in 1980 who no longer exist today right because something along the way they didn't adapt or somebody came and disrupted them they weren't able to adapt and for whatever reason you know they went away and then other companies came up and you know built different things or or certain companies like apple or microsoft just get started by you know either young 20 year olds or you know 19 year old or and then they disrupt other companies who are giants at the time, mm-hmm. right? So it's a... Especially it's a, if it's a new concept. It's a new concept and thinking outside the box and everything like that. But that's that's why I learned from him. And one thing that he helped me, and I've told this to him in an email before, when I went to SEAL training is... And I was also a little older by this time. But I mean, practices at Notre Dame were tough, man. They were physically tough. They were mentally tough. They were emotionally tough. Because, like, I mean, you're tired from school. You're tired from all this stuff. And then you had to get to practice and be locked on, right? And, I mean, everybody's on you on every little nuance of your of your job. And so it's it, our practices were very intense. And they took all your effort and focus and everything like that. And, and, uh, and when I went to SEAL training... You know, and all the instructors are hard on you and stuff like that. There's nothing that anybody could have ever said to me when I was going through SEAL training that could have had the effect of what, like when Coach Holt had said something to me at Notre Dame about doing my job. So by this time I had matured a little bit, but after being under that tutelage for five years, like the SEAL training was extremely hard, but the mental part above anybody trying to mess with me or, or yeah, you know, uh, you know, was, was not hard. So what did you major in? Oh man, yeah, counting. Ca- counting, right? Yeah, bean counter. Uh, nerd alert! Yeah, nerd alert. Uh, that was rough. Yeah, if uh, <clears throat> I'm glad I got through that, but if y'all ever want to know what the the, the accountant looks like, <laughs> yeah. I think there's a movie, him. right? This yeah. Guy, yeah. Yeah, 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 this is the guy right yeah. here. So you actually tough. you go to play football at Notre Dame. Yeah, you major in accounting, and I had a second major in philosophy. Yeah. Which is God, super, is that why you're like that? <laughs> <laughs> which is super hard when you're a football rough. player for a school like that. Yeah. Like that is your life. So to yeah. actually have a hard degree on top of it, yeah, is kind of unheard of. There's yeah. not a lot of guys that do the football at the same time as a hard degree. Yeah, and you know what? For accounting, I had a great accounting teacher in high school. Her name was uh, Mrs. Askins. Super sweet lady. Shout out to her. She, uh, and she, and I just loved the structure and I loved the. Uh, the objectivity of accounting at the time. All right, let's talk about the game changer that every business needs. The secret weapon that has been right here at the helm of the TNQ online shop, Shopify. Shopify isn't just another platform. It's the turbo boost behind countless thriving businesses worldwide, just ensuring everybody's running like a well-oiled machine. And whether you're just stepping out in the e-commerce arena for the first time, you're expanding to physical stores, or you're hitting that sweet million dollar mark, Shopify is your steadfast partner through all of it. From selling trendy tees to posters to dominating the service industry, it doesn't really matter what you do with Shopify's flexibility and seamless POS system, They've got you covered through all of it. But you want to know what really makes Shopify stand out? Okay, so imagine their checkout as the LeBron James of the internet. Skyrocketing sales by 36% compared to any other platform. This is easily my favorite feature from them because what they do is they're just so successful at it. You really can't beat it. If you're ready to take your business to the next level, Score a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash TNQ. When it comes to growth and success, Shopify is your slam dunk. Remember, with Shopify, you're not just a business owner. You're a champion of your industry. 
Experience the difference at shopify.com slash TNQ. You know, when I got into Notre Dame, it was really hard. Um, I mean, I'd be so tired from practice and, and we had tutors too and stuff like that, but um, it, it was, it was extremely hard major for me. Philosophy was kind of like a little break, you know, cause instead of being so objective, it was, you know, you can discuss these different ideas, but then some of the ideas were so kind of complex and had multiple layers in them. Uh, you know, it was just like, that was tough on a different way, you yeah, know? So, um, but I, I really enjoyed it. I, there was a great professor at Notre Dame at the time named TV Morris and everybody, uh, at, at that time you had a call to get into classes. So you called like the system. And if you were one of the first people to call, you could kind of like get in the classes because you had to get all your prerequisites. And then, uh, but if once you were in one of his classes, and I think I had him two or three times when I was in college, no one missed his class because if you missed his class, it's what everybody talked about the rest of the day, what happened in that class that day. Yeah. So you had a, excuse me, a professor who made class so exciting just with the topics and the way he'd present ideas and do different things in the class. It was so engaging. And all you did was learn and laugh. I, I, yeah. I had one like that too. You had like you, one. Yeah, that, absolutely. You yeah. didn't want to miss this class. You didn't want to miss this class. Never had a teacher like that really? in my life. Yeah. They exist. They exist. They sure yeah. do, man. Yeah. And it, and it takes a special because it takes, it's part their knowledge and it's part their personality. Yeah, the way they do it. Yeah. And so his personality, when he'd come to class and, you know, be taken and talking about an idea and he knew how to weave it in with different uh, things or uh, that were funny. And then like, if you, if you raised your hand, he'd throw candy to you. And then I remember one time he started throwing floss. He's like, my wife's a hygienist or a, d a dentist or something like that, you know, so I need to, but he was just, it was just funny. And so everybody, it was something that everybody talked about if you weren't there that day. Oh, what happened in yeah. J.B. Morris's class, you know? So Notre Dame's great. I went up to a Bengal Bows the other day. Or yeah. The other day. Um, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. The other <laughs> yeah. Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah a couple of years ago the other day. Quarantine, you know, I threw my <laughs> clock way off, man. Yeah. All right. So after Notre Dame, then where we go? Wait, wait. Yeah. So when you're, you're not thinking you're going to go to the NFL, did you even try? I, I tried. I mean, I knew, I mean, even at Notre Dame, I wasn't like a big star there. I was mainly like a second string. I, I played outside linebacker. We had great athletes and players. I mean, I knew even when I was at Notre Dame, like, you know, like, like when we would go test, you know, like for a 40 yard dash and stuff, you know, like I needed to be there early I needed to do like a, this, like really, you know, kind of like thought out warm up and stuff. And there are other guys that played on the team that just kind of like come in there and like not even have the tired wiped out of their eyes yet. Like, oh, do I need to run a 40 now? Like, yeah. And like, just kind of like, okay, boom. Run yeah. Come around the pajamas. Like, yeah. Maze, hey, yeah. And just and like storm. And like down. run a four, four, you know? Yeah. And I'm just like, why am I And here? then goes back to bed. <laughs> yeah. And then we got them. Yeah, yeah, they got exist, them. bro. They exist, man. Oh like just gosh. incredible, incredible athletes. And so. You know, and, and I wasn't, uh, you know, like on that level or whatever. So, I, I mean, I, I played backup and I played uh, on all the special teams, had a wonderful time traveling around the country there, uh, you know, played with incredibly talented people. We almost won the national championship in 93, um, you know, ended up, I think, number two that year. But uh, yeah, just an incredible it's experience. It's exciting. It just the the vibe on campus is when when the football team is oh, kicking ass. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like no other man. Especially like I mean, Notre Dame fans are super loyal. So even if there's a losing season, that doesn't, you, doesn't matter. That that, that that stadium will be packed. Rudy fixed that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think it's almost been like that. I mean, as far as I can remember, as so far as I can here so there's just this great camaraderie on the campus and a great notre dame they talk about the notre dame spirit mm. and, and it's a uh real real thing you know even into you know your you know your business days and everything like that and and even just uh the town too right uh yeah south bend um south bend Indiana. it's funny because uh holtz would you know you get all that chicago weather you know and uh um you know so it was just uh you know it's I mean, it's cold in the winters, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, and I always joke about it because anytime I go like to Chicago for business meetings or I'm back in South Bend and it's like kind of towards winter or late fall, no matter what direction I face and I'm walking, like the wind is blowing. Is, is blowing. Oh, and yeah. I, I could turn, I could be walking one direction, turn right around it and the wind, yeah, it's like the winds. <laughs> yeah, it's the windy city for a reason. It's the yeah. worst in the winter. I cannot <laughs> oh, it's, handle It's cold, that. man. Yeah, oh, that, that, that wind that comes down like from Hudson Bay from the Arctic, and hits the uh, Great Lakes, you know, and funnels through there. It's like different than New York or Boston, or uh, in my opinion, yeah, you know, it's for sure. yeah, it's it's another level. So you decided you're gonna take your your learning to a higher level. Oh yeah. So I, yeah. Well, and I also after five cold winters in South Bend, Indiana, I chose uh, 
I chose a law school by latitude. So, <laughs> so I like, I'm going somewhere warm, right? Uh, so yeah, so I ended up going to uh, Pepperdine and had just- uh, That's a great campus. Oh, it's a beautiful campus. It's such a great time. The law school is kind of like at the top of the hill on campus because Pepperdine's kind of so built this mountain. Man. Yeah. And just that whole area was like so beautiful. And that was, you know, and I also needed a time to uh, just like, you know, I was physically worn out from five years at Notre Dame and always trying to kind of like feeling like I was almost on the brink of making my dream, but not quite there. And, and, uh, and so like, uh, it was, it was just a place for me to like, you know, kind of have respite and, and just focus on one thing, school and just had a wonderful time there, you know? That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Pepperdine was great. So did you uh, go back? Did you go with us on Patriot Tour when we went to Pepperdine? Uh -huh. No, I was not with you on that yeah. trip. Well, you guys went there. No, we don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We went yeah. to Pepperdine, yeah. and uh, the student body had invited Marcus out, and it happened to be when we were doing a Patriot Tour at the Ronald Reagan Museum. Oh yeah, and yeah. So um, they had the flags up. So it was during 9-11. Yeah, where they have all the flags And all there. the flags were up on yeah. campus. And Marcus gave a little talk to the students. And it was still to this day, I think, one of the coolest events. Well, I used to sport that Pepperdine shirt for a while. <laughs> yeah. like, did you go there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a day. For a day, <laughs> yeah. For one day. We went to that campus. And I will never forget. Are we still on 9-11? Um, we post yeah, that fun. picture of yeah. him standing by the flag. So it's yeah. so pretty. Because they have a flag for every single person that died. You can't yeah. Yeah. barely see the grounds yeah. when, they play, when they cover that thing up. Exactly. And it's... Uh, if you're if you were from United Kingdom for for that person, they have United Kingdom flag. Yeah. Right? They have a flag for every single person. I tell you what, if, when people do that, if y'all don't think that we notice that, yeah, I feel like sometimes that happens. Like, yeah, oh, we've been doing this, we do it anymore. Yeah, and even if you, we do, oh, we notice it. We yeah. freaking note it. Yeah, and we talk we talk about it when you're not when you don't know about right. it. Right, absolutely. Super special. Very yeah, special. I, I love that tradition that they do there. You yeah. Usually get talked about in places where you're not. Yeah, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, very true. So what very. you're you're in. Pepperdine. Yeah, so I'm in Pepperdine Law School, and um, and so I, I started Pepperdine Law School in '97, and then uh, fall of '97, graduated in 2000. But then I had I, I had I was doing a joint degree between my Juris Doctorate and my Master's in Dispute Resolution in Pepperdine when I was there, and I still I think they still do have the number one dispute resolution school in the country. Um, we we're always tied with Harvard at the time, and we had some great great professors, and so. Nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, um, and then so, uh, yeah, so then I, I had uh, finished my whole next year of 2001. I still had like an externship to do and I had a huge thesis I had to write, which was extremely stressful, uh, which took me like a whole semester to write it, uh, to graduate with uh, my master's degree, which was kind of like in the fall of, or I'm sorry, the spring of 2001. Um, and then during that time, like, you know, I was always you know thinking about the navy and stuff like that and you know i always say the difference between like, i always say there's a huge jump between having a dream and having the courage to follow it um because i, I because i had a dream to be a navy seal since i was 15 years old what made you have that well what gave you that so you remember yeah i, I remember like it was yesterday so I was in, I was in, uh, so like probably in high school, like, you know, you have like your different so social groups and people that do different things was this kid in our school. And I would probably have been considered, you know, a jock or whatever. And there's this kid in our school who, who, uh, you know, was, uh, he was like a, a brawler and he, and, and I got along with pretty much everybody. Right. But this kid fought almost every week at some point after school. And we'd go like, you know, and you know, like, oh, someone's fighting somebody. And I went to a public school, like, you know, and you'd go and watch him. I'd say he's like maybe 50-50. That's a big know? deal. I remember right. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was big just deal. a scrapper. Yeah, he's a scrapper. And uh, and so I remember one time, and he was a couple of years older than me. So his locker was like right next to mine. And between classes one day, uh, I was uh, grabbing my books, and he's grabbing my books. You know, like we got five minutes between, you know, the bell rings. You got five minutes to grab your books for the next class and and go. And, and, I, and I, so his, his locker was like two or three down from mine. And I remember saying to him, like, I was like, hey, buddy, I go, I go, what are you going to do after you graduate? Because, I mean, you know, it seemed like his main focus was fighting, right? And, and I remember him grabbing his book. He goes, I'm going to go be a Navy SEAL. And I was like, what is a Navy SEAL? <laughs> and he goes, this is the toughest military unit in the whole world. And I remember to this day when he said that to me, I felt like this 
almost like electricity go through my uh i passed the gift to you yeah like uh, yeah. yeah like it's like, like he was the one who was supposed to tell you what you were gonna do <laughs> exactly i felt it like go through me and i remember it stayed with me as i walked to my next class and i remember as i walked to my next class and this is 1988 or something i remember thinking to myself i can't wait to get home and look in the encyclopedia <laughs> To, yeah, see, right. Back in to see what a Navy SEAL is, because that's because that's what we had the encyclopedia, right? And so, uh, so uh, has no yeah, no that. concept of that. Yeah, I just had to look it up. Yeah, so I remember I uh, that feeling that I had that day never left me until I became a Navy SEAL. It would so it was like this like this glow that happened to me. Wait, so was it in the encyclopedia? Yeah, it was. It was in there like a little bit, you know, yeah. like a naval special warfare or whatever. It's found. And uh, whatever, whenever I would, you know, and then I was playing football and doing different things. But whenever I would go talk to anybody that I, you know, was in the Navy or this or that, or I thought had a remote clue of what a SEAL was or something like that, or you know, they were Air Force, anything. Go, oh, have you ever heard of names? Anytime anybody would get get information for me or talk about it, it's like that electric glow would kind of like yeah. would go up, right? And it never went away. So, and then even while I was doing other things, it was still always kind of in my heart. And then I didn't realize that dream. Till I was 30. Well, right. Wait, so even as a 15 year old, were you telling your parents or was this something you kept to yourself? No, it's something like, well, I, I kind of told my dad, I was like, Dad, have you ever heard, you know, of Navy SEALs and tell my mom? And, and then, uh, um, and then, uh, and I think he had heard about him or something like that. So I would kind of talk about it with him, but I wasn't like, I'm definitely going to go do that one day. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like in an intelligence gathering mode of like, did you see Navy fascination? Seals? Yeah, with Charlie Sheen. That's one got me. Yeah, that, that, that guy. Yeah, that got yeah. me. I tried to act like him while I was in there. You know, the oh, whole, yeah. yeah, that drive the convertible. Yeah. The whole, you know, that, that whole thing. Yeah, and I think is it that actor Michael Bean? He's yeah. like been a Navy SEAL. He's like, the Navy SEAL on yeah, TV three or four times in movies with Abyss. And That's right. Navy that's where most, I think we're, that's where most of us got the way we were supposed to act. <laughs> yeah, Michael to Beam act. and Charlie, yeah. we did. Thank you guys. Oh Look man, what you created. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was. Uh, yeah. So that and then so and then my whole time in college, I would ask some of the ROTC guys or something if they knew anything about it. Uh, I would ask when I was in law school. I was uh, I had some Notre Dame people that friends that were now down in San Diego. I'd go down there and talk to some of the seals about it, and and some of the guys were you know cool to me, and some of them not so. So did cool, the high you know, school guy go into the teams? I don't know because I just lost touch with them. And he's always a couple I, years. Yeah, old, I, I, I think I would have known if he had. Um, th there's other people from my hometown that have gone in, but uh, I think I would have known if he had specifically had because you know I would have heard about sure, it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. But uh, so I don't know what en ever ended up happening to him. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you're at Pepperdine. Yeah. Fall of 2001. <clears throat> yeah, so fall of 2001. So like I had, so, you know, uh, to my point of there's a big difference between uh, having a dream and having the courage to follow it. I was kind of like skirting around my dream for a long time. I had, I like, I wanted to do this, but I, what, I didn't really have the courage to like, pull the trigger and, and fully go do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I like shortly before that, I was like, okay, well maybe I'll just like kind of buddy up. Maybe I could like talk to him. I go, what if I just join the reserves and I'm close, but you know, da, 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 because I was scared to sign my name on the dotted line. And then, and then if I failed or something like that, it was like something like my heart. I'm not sure if I could handle that, handle that. Right. And but so at this point you had not failed at anything. Yeah, but well, I but I had also not reached the full echelon of like my dreams and everything either, right? So like, like while I had an incredible time at Notre Dame, like you know, you go there and no one goes there to become second string. You want to go there and start and mm -hmm. and play. And I and I and I played on all our special teams, and I would rotate in every now and then on some of our defensive packages. But for the most part, I was a second string guy, and so like you know, it's like so that was something I put <clears throat> a tremendous time and effort towards you know, for five years and didn't see like what I would have been the fulfillment of my complete dream. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely a huge part of it, but not the, the whole thing. And so like, I was just, I, I, you know, wanted to do this, but I was like, all right, man. Cause like, once you sign your not name on the Navy, like that's it, you're, you're part of the Navy. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and so, uh, and also I was trying to get myself in, um, really good shape or train for it. But a lot of times while I was trained for it, I, I'd like kind of injure myself with overuse injuries, get tendonitis in like my foot or something like that. Or um, I remember when I was do, trying to do pull-ups, I got tendonitis in my elbow and it stayed with me for seven years. Oh my God. Yeah, and I got uh, the inside thing they call it golf elbow or something like that. But um, 
But yeah, I was like, while I was training, I went through all the way through buds with it. It was horrible. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, um, and so, so then after nine 11 happened, I called my recruiter and I was getting ready to go to boot camp in October. And I said, I'm all in, I go all hands on deck. Let's press to get my package approved to try to go to buds and everything like that. And I told my parents on September 13th, two days after September 11th, they didn't know I was in, where I, were you, what were you doing? Nine eleven went down. Yeah. Um, well, so I was in LA and I was living in like this little apartment and my phone starts blowing up like, cause you know, it's, uh, over, um, the first one that hit, I believe was at nine o'clock or so. I can't, 903 or 903 or something, or something, something like that. that. So on the West coast, it was, you know, six or something. And, uh, and so my phone starts blowing up and, and at first someone calls me, I was just like, all right, didn't think anything of it sleeping. And the next thing it blows up and I call him and one of my buddies uh, who played, played football with me at Notre Dame, who's still one of my best friends to this day. He's like, Wags like, I, you know, plane hit the tower. My brother's in there, mm. you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And so I, mean, I didn't have any, you know, money at the time. So I didn't have a TV. Um, so I was like, I couldn't watch it on television. This is like before you can go like on YouTube on your phone or something to watch it. So I had to go like call a friend and said, hey, can I come over to watch the news? Because, you know, go, do you see what's happening? So uh, and then he called me later and he said, oh, I think they we found him or whatever. And then later they found in the, the, but they had it, you know? Mm. So he, 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 he lost died. it. Yeah. He died. He lost his life and nine 11. So then, um, and, uh, I was just such a, you know, everyone, it's just like one of those things where everyone remembers what they were and what they're doing. And it was like hard for me to kind of like even fathom, like what was going on and what this all meant and who did this at the time and everything like that. Cause we're all trying to, everyone's trying to figure it out and put together, I'm sure, sure you know? And so I was like, I was just, you know, you know, didn't really know who had been behind the attacks or, or how they had, or why they, who, who would do something like this and put it together. Anyways, news came out and everything like that. You know, then on September, I told my recruiter and he's like, well, he goes, did your parents know you're going to, you want to go full go to this? And I go, no, so they don't this even. this was on 9-11, you called your recruiter? Yeah, right around there. Well, I had been talking to him about okay. different things, but it was like, kind of like, um, you know, after this, I said, I'm, you know, full in or whatever. And then we, uh, um, and, and he was a great guy and did an incredible job for me. And he goes, you should tell your parents. He goes, but he, he, then he told me, he goes, Hey, I just want you to know, like, no one knows what's going to happen now. So he goes, you might not ever, he goes, now you're in the reserve. They might just call you up to go, you know, be on a ship somewhere. Right. And I'm like, all right, we'll put my package in. Cause like before, like, you know, the reserves is just like, you just, you're, it's a great place to be. You can do different things, but you don't have to, uh, go, you know, like for the most part, you're not reserves gonna get, are a great place to be. Right. You're, you're not going to get called up. Right. For the most part, like unless there's a huge war. But at this time, when 9-11 happened, they didn't know if they were going to call them all up. You know, so. So anyway, um, I told my parents on September 13th and, uh, you know, had a great conversation with them. And it was, it was funny because my dad, I didn't even find this out till maybe like a year or two ago. Like my dad said, yeah, on that day, you know, you called us and, you know, I was going to the kitchen to get on the speakerphone with mom and. You know, he goes, as soon as I got up from my chair and I just turned around to walk towards there, I just like had this thought like Billy's going to go become a Navy SEAL. And I hadn't talked to them about it or anything. You know, he just had the thought. But when I remember when I told them, I couldn't believe how calm they were. I was like, man, they're <laughs> taking this well. Like, like yeah. Oh, they did? Yeah. You know, my dad, like when I told my parents, I go, hey, guys, you know, September 11th happened. I just want you to know that um, I'm enlisted in the Navy and uh, I'm going to go to become a Navy SEAL or, you know, put my be best effort to do so. I just remember there was like a pause on the phone and my dad goes, he goes, Hey son, uh, he goes, uh, <clears throat> he goes, you know, we'll support you the way we've always supported you in everything that we do. And then he said to me, he goes, and if I was younger, I'd want to go too." you know? So I thought that was really touching. 9-11 helped with all that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, uh, and then it was great because I got to share that journey with them, you know? So then they came to my boot camp. You know, and uh, graduation. No. Walking tall, right? <laughs> yeah. Walking tall out of boot camp. <laughs> yeah. Navy man had that oh, Navy ball man. cap on, didn't yeah. he? <laughs> oh, man, I lost, I lost so much weight in boot camp. I came through there because they fed me the same amount that they would feed, you know, like you got the same amount whether you were... Uh, that was the worst. 110 I, dude, pounds or 240. That, that was the worst part about boot camp. Oh, I was always hungry. I was so hungry and... Uh, 
I would go there and uh, you know how the, you're in the line of move on shipmate. Yeah. Hey, thank, you, <laughs> thank you, shipmate. And then you got that other guy with the rag, maintain my bride work, shipmate. And you're like, it's four o'clock in the morning. Quit calling me shipmate. We're not even on a damn ship. Give me, give me some more waffles, man. I'm starving to death. <laughs> That's the way I felt, man. Dude, it was. I was so hungry. I remember I couldn't wait. Like all I would think about all the time was food, you know. And I was like, and I would get there, and I was just like, and I kind of like knew they wouldn't give it to me if asking, but I kind of like give them the like, hey, yeah. hey yeah, yeah. Well, and they're like, they're, move on, shit, mate. I'm like, really? Because you know they hate being there too. Yeah. You don't realize that everyone's miserable there, and. Do yeah. any of the skinny guys give you extra food? That oh, no. no, no, Man, no. They're, they're, the skinny guys get skinnier to stay the same. And then, yeah. you know, you got to get a chit. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, when, I, when I came back to my command, uh, people didn't even recognize me. I mean, my uniform was like hanging off of me like a hanger. And I was just like, they're like, oh, my God, what happened to you? I'm like, I went to boot camp. <laughs> so when we get measured for our Navy uniforms, they yeah. measured us in boot camp. Yeah, yeah. And then when we got into the SEAL teams, I remember trying to put them things back on. Yeah. It like spandex. Yeah. All the way around. All the way around. God, oh, man. Dog. What a good so time, right? into BUDS at what age? So I, I got my package approved to go to SEAL training just right under, like, when I was late, probably 28 years old, which is, so I didn't need any age waivers. And I started... It's, it's at 28, or what is it? Yeah, so I started, it's 28 was the age cutoff. Get, it's the cutoff, yeah. right? And then I started training, SEAL training when I was 29. And I'm enlisted, not an officer, and I have three degrees. And good I, for you, man. Yeah, good for me. Fucking yeah. hard. When, That's a SEAL right when there. People find that, found that out about me in the Navy, you're like... Dude, man, what your recruiter just screw you? I was like, no, he was actually really great. And the reason I came in and enlisted instead of officer is because uh, this captain on the East Coast who was uh, mentoring to me at the time, he's like, listen, he goes, if you want to go OCS, you're, you're, there's only so many billets. A billet's like a spot, you know, because they only take so many officers. Um, he goes, and the Naval Academy takes up, you know, a Most great of majority of them. And he goes, and ROTC is the next group. And then for OCS, we just we have a few spots. You know, he goes, and for you to compete for those few spots, I remember he told me, he goes, I want your, you know, push-up sit-ups here and your asthma up here and all this stuff. And I go, all that I could do until he goes, and then you need to be under, if you, for you to be competitive for an OCS spot, you need to run your mile and a half under nine minutes, like an 8.55. You get an 8.55, good. And I, t I, I told him, I go, uh, so that's like a sub six minute pace, right? I go, you can pull me with a jet pack, a plane, train, automobile. <laughs> you I put go, me in it. You put me in the put, car. Put me in the car one. and that's not going to happen. There's right? some of us you can clock with a sundial. I'm yeah, one of them too, bro. Exactly. I, I was yeah. like, well, I'm not your guy. <laughs> yeah, so, so he said, the other thing you can do is just go enlist and then once you become getting the SEAL team. That's the best the way to go. Yeah, I think it's the best way to go. A lot of it, the best, another great thing about being in the teams is when you're sitting around, you find out what someone does or their right. backstory. Yeah, yeah. Like with him. Yeah. When everyone found that out, he was a lawyer and was a philosophy major. Yeah. An accountant. An accountant and, 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 and all player. that. Yeah. <laughs> this is just the best, man. But yeah. if you go in enlisted, then you become, become a sniper. You can get all the schools. Right. You get all the quals. All the quals. All the quals. All the officers from my, my buzz class, yeah. I would always say, come in enlisted. And then yeah. that's what exactly. Mojo did. Morgan did that. Switched yeah. over. Mustang did. It's, I think it's the it's best. It's the best. It's the best. And I tell everybody. Now, that you can go man. all the way to probably chief. Chief. And then transfer And then over. transfer over. And then you, man, then you the big dick swinging when you walk in the, in the freaking. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, and that's, and that's what I try to tell everybody is like, I go, if you go in enlisted, you can go to sniper school. You can go to all the good schools. I go, your officers are worth your weight in, in the teams. You, you have to have good officers. You got to have good officers. You got to have good officers, period. But like, I mean, they are overall in charge of the mission. So they got a lot going on. They got mobility. They got air. They're deconflicting with this. They got to know where all their fire teams are. Can you are. believe that? Yeah. And not only that, they have to watch out for us. A bunch right. of maniacs running around. Right, exactly. Who just want to annihilate everything. Right. And at the max age, we're probably <laughs> in our early 30s. Yeah. Think of the discipline that these guys have now. Oh, I know, man. It's Especially, incredible. bro, our officers in Ramadi that we yeah. went. Oh, the best. Yeah. Yeah. Now that I look back at those guys, yeah, yeah. like AJ and all, and yeah. Burke and all them guys, yeah. are you kidding me? We yeah. had that. They were that, awesome. That, that we lived through that. Yeah. That they that they still have careers. <laughs> yeah. They kept us in line. That's what I'm talking about. That's how well they did. Right. I, now, now when I think back, I wonder if they were ever like together. The officers would get together at the end of the had day. Had to. And like, 
Damn. Marcus and Wags. Had to. Drink, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Drink. Yeah. Now, only, only a few more Freaking months. gray right? hair, dude. They're 20 years old. I mean, they must have had that. God they bless those guys. God bless Freaking those guys. God bless them guys, yeah, man. We were, Especially uh, in Ramadi. Yeah, we were holy We were pretty uh, intense. Right? We're not there yet. We'll, we'll so play no, that. You yeah. don't get your trident until you're 30? Yeah, so I graduate SEAL training when I was 30. Um, and uh, yeah, that was a really special day. And um, yeah, because I was by far the oldest guy in my BUDS class. And then I was, because when everybody graduated from BUDS, all the enlisted guys had signed for the enlisted, the SEAL challenge contract, which automatically when they graduated from BUDS, took them to the pay grade E4 or third class petty officers rank. And I was still a seaman or, or a pay grade E3. So then going through SQT. Can you believe that's a rank in the damn Navy? Yeah, they call us seaman. <laughs> yeah. Can you freaking believe that? <laughs> and it's still a thing. Yeah. So it's uh, so then it was like uh, I was um, immediately the most junior guy in the class. So you know like when they, you know, the instructors, every time there's a really crappy job to do, they'd be like, hey, who's the junior man? And they're like, oh, that's Wags. <laughs> yeah. So you get worse jobs. That. Yeah, worst jobs. Yeah, worst jobs. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, then when I joined my first SEAL team, SEAL Team Five Alpha Platoon, um, great platoon, great, great bunch of guys. Uh, you know, I, I was the the only guy older than me in the whole buds in, in my whole platoon at SEAL Team Five Alpha was my old salty chief who had been done like six, seven deployments. I mean, been in since like the late '80s or something oh like gosh. that. Oh my gosh! Yeah, great. That was great. So that was January of 2004 where I pro- reported. Uh, SEAL Team 5, and that was a great time. And this was before all the money, I think, was... At this time, the money was still getting approved to come into the SEAL teams or had been approved, but all the build, big building projects and everything that the SEAL Oh, teams, you can tell when that showed up. Oh, when that showed up, yeah. Because, you know, like our platoon space, when I went into it, like, report to... Yeah, it's right back there. And that, I was like, I was like, have they done anything with this since Vietnam? No. I mean, and they, <laughs> no, they hadn't. They hadn't. Like, when we checked in, yeah. it was Vietnam style. Yeah. And they didn't keep it clean for us either, man. It was like, here's your deal. Yeah. It was uh, It was a little eye-opening. You it know? was. And, and that's and, why and people couldn't find us. Yeah. Like, there's no way that we would put our most highly trained assets in that. <laughs> in that. Like, hell yeah, that's exactly <laughs> that's where they put exactly us. And now they look like something out of Men in Black. Oh, oh man. It's incredible, man. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And then we sound like It's those, what it should look like. It's what it yeah. should look like. Yeah. And yeah. But we sound like those guys like, oh, back in my day right yeah. Yeah. and now that's how you get to complain yeah. Th- that's how that works that's how that because when works. you the guys and granted they earned it they're yeah, badasses they, yeah, yeah. they're freaking badasses yeah. but their playground so you know all old retired frogs we yeah. just need to go put tents and just hang out there yeah exactly and like, they can't kick us out because yeah. it's a seniority thing yeah. military or not they can't get rid of us yeah oh yeah it was gosh. uh it's freaking nice man yeah it's what they got now is incredible man i loved being at five i thought that yeah was, i love five i love five that's where we met yeah yeah so really let's get into no. you and i oh yeah you and i yeah yeah yeah, no, yeah. let's get into that <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't She's know one of the, uh, i mean <laughs> no, 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 she, yeah, came through and, uh, no. okay so that was in um 2000 and you'd done two platoons already right yeah so well let me go yeah so i uh no this was my second appointment but like so between my first appointment and second appointment right when i came back um, I wanted to go to sniper school and like no one at the, this is kind of funny. No one at the team would, would sign off on sending me because they would all be like, oh, Wags, you're too big. You look like a Yeti walking through the woods. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, where the hell are you going to hide? Yeah. Right. So then everybody goes on leave when we come back from our first platoon, but I'm the ordnance rep. So I have to stay behind, do the final inventory and get everything switched over. So I had to stay for like an extra week, you know, and go over all our broken weapons and why they were broken, you know, right. Report. Every piece of art has oh to be accounted gosh, for. Dude. Every single, uh, that's the, what's the hardest, one of the hardest jobs is uh, that one. I was an ordnance rep twice for Ramadi Man, yeah. and my first platoon. And it was, it was like, that's where my accounting came into handy. Like, because yeah, I mean, right? you, I was in charge of 430 serialized items. If I lost any of them, it was my head, the LPO's head, the chief's head, the voice's head. You get fired and they're, everybody gets fired. so hard on us about yeah. that. Oh, yeah. So that was a stressful, stressful job. Being a team guy is awesome. Yeah. But they find ways. And yeah. that's one. Of, I mean, our accountability for Medgear, too. Oh, like, all I was in charge of all yeah. that. And if yeah. I even, and we're talking about, that's two completely different things. Right. One, one killing and one healing. Yeah. Doesn't matter. I yeah. feel like that should be like an outsourced job oh, to I, a regular Navy person. I, oh, well, you, then what happens is we, we if something messes up. Yeah. Think about it like that. Yeah. So if they screw up, we come down on them even harder, and then yeah. there's all like, we're not even training, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It was that, it was a very very stressful job because every month, like you know, it, it was very very stressful. Um, you know, somebody forgets where they put something, and then I gotta go help. And you remember when we were in Rwanda, even like 
Like I remember someone goes, uh, someone comes to me and he goes, uh, Wags, we're missing a 50 cal. Cause you know, like when you're getting prepped to go on the missions and someone's like, Oh, we don't need this one. And instead of going back into the armory and put it where it was, they hit it behind it inside a Connex box way back there and go, Oh, when I come back, I'll get it. Well, then what happens is you go on a mission. There's so much stuff happening on the mission. Then you come back and you're tired and you're, and you're taking, and you forget about it until we need it again. Right. And then I was like, I remember saying to Charlie Melton, I go, uh, I go, uh, I go, Melton, I'm missing a 50 cal. And he, you know, you know, cause now it's my head and my career on the line. Right. And he goes, he goes, Oh, wags, don't worry about that. He goes, people in the Navy, they've lost uh, people in the military. They've lost submarines, tanks. <laughs> <laughs> Any great. Yeah. And I was That's like, Charlie Melton logic, dude. That son of a gun is the best to have around. <laughs> so, uh, it did make me feel a little better. I go, you're right. People probably lost airplanes, tanks. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we, we found it like somebody that we found it in the Connex box. And, and then one guy's like, odd oh, man, I forgot to put it there, but dude, that yeah. happened a couple of times with, with the MP5. that oh, one time. I know, And I mean, cause yeah. it's a, it doesn't matter if we're getting shot at, blown up, and then we could be in the middle of that. Somebody be like, "Hey, we're missing the weapon," and we'd be like, "All right, stop what you're doing." <laughs> yeah, like, well, yeah, how it's like, it is. Yeah, because our, our CEO, he, he, he was great, but yeah. we didn't want to ever deliver that kind of news. You had to be him. responsible. No, so you kind of keep it he really had quiet. So much stuff to deal yeah. with. Rhino, dude, how yeah, awesome that he was. Awesome, guy. just so good. Yeah, man. and we always kept it quiet, and then we go find it. But you got to kind of get everybody together <laughs> and like huddle. And it's then, like the <laughs> secret that goes around, <laughs> yeah. that you're just like, yeah, sure, like, hey guys, it's like a whisper that goes you want to see camp. navy seals really get top secret yeah it's when something like, like that, that like, goes down yeah, yeah. drone and we gotta go find it like all right don't fall. <laughs> yeah. so uh freaking good time but man. yeah so yeah so so i was in the ordinance rep so then uh so then someone goes the the other ordinance rep who was acting lpo at the time comes down and we were really good friends because we had done ordinance together and there you always have two people for every department he comes down and goes, hey, they're asking if anybody wants, they have an extra slot for sniper school. Does anybody want to, if you know any, he goes, Wags, if you know anybody who wants to go, uh, let me know. And I go, yeah, I'll take it, right? Because I was like, I'll take it. And there was no one else there because everyone else is on leave, right? right yeah. So he goes, okay, I'll put your name in. So then that's how I got to go to sniper school. And when the guys came back, they're like, Wax, how'd you get that spot to go? So I'm going to go, you guys all left for a leave. And I was the only one. I was just hanging around. I was just hanging around. I, yeah. That happened so much. It happened so much. You're the only guy there. You're the only guy there. Yeah. You just happened to be sitting around on a Saturday or something crazy. <laughs> He's going down. Everyone else goes on leave, does something fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and you get the call. With summer right around the corner, it's time to gear up and protect your eyes from the blazing summer sun. I've got the shades just for you. It's Shady Rays. Imagine this, you're out soaking up the sun, whether it's hit the waves or you're trekking the trails. What's my go-to accessory? Without a doubt, it's my Shady Ray shades. I rock the deep, stylish, deep timber, wooden frame glasses, and let me tell you, these things are awesome. Just the last few weeks I've been wearing them, I've gotten a handful of compliments, and there's nothing better to boost your confidence than just looking stylish. These shades are premium polarized sunglasses that won't break the bank, and with over 300,000 five-star ratings, you know they gotta be good, right? In durability, these shades can handle whatever adventure you throw at them. And with their lost and broken protection included, you can pretty much just do whatever. It's awesome. Plus, Shady Rays is offering free shipping and returns so you can try them out risk-free. And here's a little treat just for you. Go head on over to ShadyRaids.com and use our code TNQ for $20 off your next pair of polarized sunglasses. Best deal of the season is just one click away. Go to ShadyRays.com and use our code TNQ. You get the call. So uh, while we were in sniper school, that's when Operation Red Wings went down. Mm. And you had just gone through sniper school. Because I, I was, this was, uh, so this would have been summer of 05 when I was in sniper school. Yeah. And so I you must have there. just gone there like before a that. class or class before yeah. that, one or two before that. Because all the instructors knew you. Yeah. And I, and I didn't know you at the time, but... Uh, I had a good time with them. Yeah. I, oh, I bet you did. We did. <laughs> you know me, bro. Like, we're, I, if I'm at a school, we all yeah. have a good time. Yeah. Man. And, and it, it was. Yeah. That school and, sucks. Yeah. Oh, that's a rough I, school. I yeah. hated that school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Truth be told. Yeah. So it that, was so hard. Didn't yeah. somebody poop in a gun that's or something? That's a different story altogether. Uh, I don't know. For a different time. Oh, altogether. they had like crazy.
crazy story. Oh, we got we got some. Dude, crazy that's what I'm talking about. Like it yeah. just got because it's yeah. three months long it's three and it's stressful every day. Yeah. It, and we're talking about like failing out. And yeah. in the teams, like you, we, I know people. America, we do a lot of crazy things, yeah. but when it comes time for a performance, we're like, hey, yeah, we're it's locked it's on, freaking locked on. So y'all really... did play some pranks. Oh yeah, well, yeah, there's, of there's course, stuff going on all the time. time. I mean, yeah. like all the time. Yeah, I well, heard some gross ones. Here's a little sidebar though. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you guys know who Johnny Kim is, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So Johnny Kim was he was a a, a new guy and he was in sniper school and I was like, wow, man, this guy got a sniper. That's school. something. Yeah, that's something right there. So in the first part of that, you know, like when we're working with cameras, it's the least stressful part of sniper school, right? It's like two weeks. And at the end of it, you're kind of putting together, like when you're doing surveillance, you're like kind of putting together like what you've seen and done and everything. And everybody's like, doesn't really care about this part. For the most part, they're throwing up a few things or slides. Oh, this is my, what I complete and stuff. I will never forget this. And neither will anybody who was in that room. Uh, when Johnny Kim got up to do his presentation of what he did, Dude, it looked like something like NASA and the NSA collaborated <laughs> on right at the top minds. Like briefing the president. To, to put together. It was, we were all like, I mean, I, I was like, oh my gosh, I hope I don't have to go after him. Like, it was, <laughs> like, it was uh, that's like when I knew that that kid at the time was now yeah, he one, is. one of the most accomplished human beings when of all time. When you see our guys do this stuff like that. Oh man, he, he, that's when I knew, like, I was like, oh man, this He's on a different level, just mentally yeah. and stuff, just like, and he was like that. Because some guys would walk up with butcher block paper and just, like, you know, like have a couple of slides, but like yeah. this right here, yeah, this that's right there, a, that right there. That's and, a car. And yeah. then, uh, then oh, you, when he put but that. What are you showing? What's the slide? It's, it's just kind of like slides of like you, like, this is just like when you're working with cameras and stuff and you got to kind of like, like you're like, you know, kind of like almost like uh, observing something. Uh -huh. and you're saying, and you're trying to put the story together of what. You know, we're seeing. Like, yeah, like like Marcus went to breakfast that day, and here's a picture. So there's and then, no video. We yeah. Got, before we get trained up on our weapon systems, like rifles and pistols, we learn yeah. how to shoot a camera. Yeah. yeah, right. And we have to actually move around in the, in the shadows and take all these pictures. And then what we have to do is we have to put it together to sell a story of someone who's watching a movie, like a cartoon uh, a character. Yeah, kind of something like that. Something like yeah. that, right? And then it has all these times, dates, and everything. Times, dates. Ja like Kim's probably had music. <laughs> oh, my God. Like Eye of the Tiger. If I, you know, anything yeah. like that, right? It was just completely done. And that's just the beginning, too. This is only beginning. Uh, yeah, th but that's right. Right then and there, that's when I knew he was special. Because yeah. I was like... Because uh, probably people to put up their whatever we did that, you know, like I'm just trying to get through this block before we go do the real hard stuff. Just going through and putting up some, all right, you know, check the box and let me go do the hard stuff. I, I can do it. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can, can do it. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, he came up there and like, I mean, everyone, you could feel the whole room kind of sink in there a little bit. <laughs> like, oh man. And uh, even, the even the instructors were blown away but I, I think they didn't want to give him because he's like a new guy right and like and there's nothing you could do except be like oh my gosh like yeah, that. Do, yeah but i mean they didn't compliment him too much but i just remember yeah, team guy yeah yeah team guy right and a new guy at that but i just i remember thinking to myself oh man this this kid's special this kid is special you well, know? That's yeah it was it was, it was uh awesome. Yeah, it was incredible. And he, and he probably put spent half the time that we did on ours. <laughs> it you took know? him five minutes. Yeah, it took him if five minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> oh, no, I just simply downloaded this thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I bet you did. I love it. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget that because that's like, uh, that was like, I was like, yeah, this guy is, he's going to go on to do. I would never predict that he was going to do everything he did, you know, because yeah. that's just such on. Where you want him. Time. That's where you want him, man. Uh, but I knew, like, oh, man, this guy's. Yeah. On another level here. He um, needs to be running for president. Oh, he should, man. Yeah. He should. Yeah, one of the greatest. I might be too good of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> too squared away. Yeah, he might be away. too good of a dude guy to be president, man. No, no, no. Oh, All right, man. so when uh, you just gotten back from your second oh, tune. Well, so well, well, so then during sniper school, that's when we heard about Operation Red Wing. Oh, check out. So when, when we're going through there, every morning that we were there and uh, we were out doing the final portion, we were like, stalking and shooting every day. Um, we would get a brief on what everything was going through, right? And like, we all thought, most people thought it was like kind of, you know, hopeless to find anybody alive based on the information that we were getting and receiving. But they were, the instructors were talking about you a lot um, and uh, how, you, how you had, you know, uh, identical twin brother Morgan. And so they were talking about you a he lot. He just went through too, right for me. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah. So then I was hearing all these stories about you and your brother and everything like that every day because the instructors knew you so like it wasn't like people that they didn't know i mean there was four there's four guys right yeah. like so um like uh so you know they were talking about you every day and then uh in the briefs and then adam downs and you had known adam since when i, f I forget how you 18 guys Del uh, 18 delta. 18 delta. okay so 
So Adams was me and Adam. I, were, we've been. That's a long, long school. That's a long. Yeah. <laughs> and he oh, and yeah. I had been then we went to SQT uh, together and yeah. everything. Oh so, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So hey, I found him. You found him? Yeah. Dude. Well, I don't found him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still alive. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I text with him every now and then. Yeah. Dude, he's, yeah. I, well, we need to tell an Adam uh, down story in a minute. Shout yeah. out Adam Down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that I, yeah, so me and Adam, we were in our first two platoons together. And me and Adam went through breacher school together and we went through sniper school. We were uh, shooting partners in sniper school. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. So so get this, so you know. Dude, he's blind. <laughs> he's blind. <laughs> so he. Uh, I'll talk smack on him, dude. I love him too much. Gargamel, I fucking oh, love you, bro. Dude. But he's, we were. In we, med school, he'd sit in the back because he didn't want to get called on. You'd oh, see yeah. him back there trying to squint and see the him. <laughs> and he wouldn't put his glasses on because he didn't want anybody to know he wore them. Yeah. <laughs> Typical team guy, right? Typical team Had guy. Had the no sex specs rocking, bro. Yeah. But he, he wouldn't freaking wear them. He's great. Oh, man. So he. Uh, so he goes, uh, so, you know, everybody loves Adam. Like, I like Adam is like the best friend everybody wants, dude. right? Yeah, just like that guy. Country. Country. Oh, oh man. Dude. So we were so we were sniper pair together in sniper school. So then Adam was telling me all about you as well, right? So this is like my prelude to We were partners in 18 Delta. I mean, there's a yeah. way. Yeah. Dude, that's Army. They stuck that's, us out, yeah. out of nowhere, so it was just a few of us. A few of it, right? So he was telling me all these stories about you as well. So now I'm hearing it from the instructors and my shooting partner, and uh, and this is a funny thing about sniper school. Uh, me and Adam were one of the only shooting pairs never to fail at least one of the tests. That's true. Wow. Yeah, and and but like what was funny is we like one of the big rules on uh, uh, in, in when you're a, a shooting pair is not to argue on the firing line. So we hear all the times instructors come down and be like. Like, if I hear any one of you arguing on the firing line, you work it out and you stay focused and you do all the stuff. Well, that's how me and Adam argued incessantly. That's how you talk. Throughout the day. That's how we talk. That's how you talk. Right? You know? It's a true story. Yeah. And, and that's mainly how Adam would just like start off in the morning giving me a hard time. Like, you know, that's how whatever. he talks. Yeah. That's and his profanity, too. Yeah. Yeah. And all that stuff. And so, like, it, like you you're know. brushing your teeth wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Whatever. You know, it's, or he'd be like, it's about time you did that. You know, yeah, so, I mean, just some, whatever. Dude. Yeah, just, just some zinger. Zinger. Just yeah, fly just right, zinger, fly right back. You're not ready for that. Oh, yeah. And he would push me, push my buttons until like I was about to boil over and then he would back off. Right. Yeah. So you're like taking me always right to the damn edge. Right to the edge. <laughs> so then we're, uh, so, but then when we're on the shooting line, we argued incessantly because I would give him a call and we got an instructor behind us all the time like i'd be like and so he would make the call and what he uh you know shut like uh because you know how you're supposed to do like one o'clock you right. know uh one o'clock you know uh two minutes or whatever on the shot and i would be like okay and i would make the correction based on the way he broke the gun and stuff like that and when i would make the correction to him he'd go uh because he doesn't he hates change he goes um no i didn't mean one o'clock <laughs> yeah, two minutes uh, i meant dead center and i'm just like so now I'm like trying to think of like how to correct that. So it was just so funny. So we get uh, that's got to be pure comedy. Oh, we were when fighting. Team guys trying yeah. to talk to each other like oh, that. Like, yeah, for the first time. For the first. Yeah. So we were fighting incessantly, and to the point to where the instructor goes, uh, they would tell us they they came a couple times to us and like you guys are gonna get kicked out of stuff. But we were passing everything right. Mm -hmm. So finally, one of the instructors, when it was time, because the instructors rotate shooting pairs. Walk them they, down. Uh, yeah, which ones they're watching each day. And so every day they'd go, all right, who wants the newlyweds? <laughs> so, <laughs> they call so yeah, the newlyweds. Yeah, they call Freaking odd couple. Yeah. Oh, my god. Yeah, gosh. and we had a great school. I mean, it's, uh, it's when something gets difficult yeah. and you're both looking at it yeah. but, and you're trying to explain to each other how yeah. to fix it. What yeah. you see is a, is really how people see things. Yeah. Because yeah. they try to explain it. Yeah. And it's, it's comedy unless you're in it. Yeah, it is. And you're yeah. trying to... Because yeah. we'll get kicked out. You get kicked They're, out. They don't think it's funny. No, they don't think it's funny. And, and, yeah. And, uh, I mean, it is, but it's not. Yeah, I think it's it, weird, man. Yeah. And so he, uh, yeah, because like if, if you fail a shooting test, you get like one makeup, right? Yeah, that's it. And so it's stressful. Like you get one makeup test and that's it. And it's so hard to get in there. Yeah, it's so hard to get in there. And so we were one of the only, like him and I neither, never by the skin of our chinny chin chin passed each time. On the first time, we never had to do even a makeup test, but it was uh, it was stressful, man. It was it was stressful. And Cyber that, school is the only reason I lived. Yeah, yeah, I bet. You the know? stalking phases, the stalking they, phases, all that stuff that they taught me right. how to be stealthy, and, and yeah. do all, that's the only reason I lived. Oh, and I it bet. was so fresh in my head. Yeah, being a medic, communicator, and a sniper. Oh, as I mean, I was truly blessed. Right. 
I mean, looking back at the quals that I had, I'd use every one of them. You used every one every of them. Every single I one bet, of them, man. Yeah, and then some. Yeah, because it's, yeah, you really think about it. Like, you learn so much in that school, and it's every day, man. Every day. Like, so morning, noon, and night. Yeah. You live out there. You live out there. When they put our asses on the ground, dude, yeah. you just wake up with it. Yeah. Wake up with wake that up rifle. With go, yeah. go do something. Go yeah. do the thing. Yeah. I bet. So you just gotten back from that when I rolled in. Yeah. On you. But so then before I met you, you know, like uh, I had heard about you from the instructors of the SEAL teams, and when they and we heard like when they found you and everything like that, and then because Adam was my shooting partner, and then we, uh, and then from there, me and Adam went to breacher school together. Me and Adam were in breacher school together. Uh, so like, so Adam had been talking about you for a long time, right? And just how he knew you and everything. So that was my prelude to ever like meeting you, you know. And then we come back from breacher school, and by this time it's probably like September, October of '05, right before we start work, work starting workup. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, Burke, who's now the commanding officer of the SEAL teams, who's our commanding officer of our platoon, our OIC. So I guess, Clint? Yeah, yeah, Clint, yeah. He, he knew you too, right? Buzz. Beforehand? They yeah. Were oh, together. Buzz, you guys were Buzz. Yeah, that's right. We were, we're dive partners. Friends. You were yeah. dive partners? <laughs> he's right there. Yeah, he's right there. And he is in charge of the center. I yeah. saw him the other day. Oh, did you? How's he doing? Great. Great. Yeah. Freaking great. Great. How yeah. about that guy, man? Yeah, he was yeah. Awesome. Oh, I know him. Yeah, he was awesome. Yeah, let me tell you something he's about that. He's amazing. That, that Ramadi stack? Yeah. Those, that, that squadron they sent out, the yeah. door to Ramadi? Yeah. Was the best. Yeah, we had some great top, guys, man. Top to bottom. Top to bottom. I still so, think about And I talk to guys yeah. who are still rolling. They're like, we, that lineup you guys had? Yeah. Right. Was badass. So it's crazy. So when he came and you hadn't showed up yet, but uh, Clint said, um, I remember him saying, we're meeting each other and goes, he goes, I'm trying to pull Marcus and his brother into the platoon. And yeah. so it was just wild. So before I had ever met you, uh, I heard about you from the instructor. And the instructors were like, knew you and were so, like so worried about you because they, you know. And then when you came, it was like when they found you, it was like this miracle, like almost like no mm -hmm. one could believe it that you were alive. Right. And then um, and, and then it was, you know, bittersweet because then we lost everybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. And then and, um, and so it was an extreme sadness as well, because we had lost so many guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, and then and then Adam, you know, talked me and Adam talked about you all the time. So then and then when I get there, then Clint saying he's bringing him. You know, so it's just like. Oh, and now he's coming to the platoon, you know? So it was yeah. just like, wow. And then you and your... Uh, uh, we both showed up. You guys day. both showed up. Yeah, I think you had a cast on your hand at that I did. Or, I just yeah. had to have reconstruct, had to reconstruct it. I just got out of the hospital. Yeah. I was doing all the surgeries to get... And then they moved me over to uh, Warcom. I had to keep their thumb on me. Okay. So like, yeah. hey, where do you want to go? I was like, five. Five, really? So had you been talking to Clint at that time? Yeah, he okay. called me up. Yeah, he's like, AJ, come over here. Like, that's exactly what happened. And did you know AJ before that too? Or? Sure did. Oh my God. I knew all those guys. All the stars All aligned. those freaking guys. And when they said they were together, I was like, please, please rescue me. <laughs> please yeah. take me. I'll hide. I was supposed to hide. Like, I, yeah. I, I remember I told you that when I first, because Morgan rolled right, right into Bravo. Yeah, yeah. Because they didn't want you going back out into Yeah, that's, they didn't want me to, they didn't think that was going to happen. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, and then you and your brother showed up and yeah, so it was. That was wild. first of the year and then we were out the door. Yeah, because then we went through workup together. Yeah, and then we when, when, when did we deploy? What, what month was that? It was in the winter. It was uh, no, it was um, we got there in September, like at the very end of September. Yeah, September, um, October, right. or or, or it might have been October of '06 because it was right after Michael Mansoor. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris Pattinson. Kyle, yeah. Mikey, uh, yeah. all those guys were those going, guys, yeah. and we were getting the feedback. Right. The, all the after action reports. Yeah, because that was Jocko's. So that was Chris Jocko's. Jocko's, Jocko's task unit, Chris Kyle. Leif Babin. Leif Babin. He took us on our first op, remember? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, we do those turnover ops. Turnover op. Yeah. So, so we all get into Ramadi. Yeah. And it's a war. Is it Tony Frey? I remember he was yeah. sent me down. He's yeah. like, hey, we're going to go out. It's called Operation Rocket Sauce. I'm yeah. Get it. yeah. So we had Rocket to Sauce? Rocket Sauce. Yeah. We'll put who on names them? Well, I named ours. I actually yeah. got the privilege of doing that. But yeah. who, like, who would name Rocket Sauce? I think that Leif's. <laughs> God, Wait, dude, yeah. I don't know who. I can't believe you remember the names of each of the missions. I got to write I them up. Has I remember all awesome. Yeah, I remember memory. all that. Yeah, I remember yeah. all the prayers I wrote up. Really, yeah, I remember all that. Man, that's a great. And because uh, I was so busted up, I, I didn't get to go out very much. I was on the line, so I had yeah. to figure out ways to get the guys imp implemented into uh, into combat. Yeah, yeah. And so, Adam Downs, the guy we were talking about, and this dude right here were my snipers. Yeah, yeah. We had we had such a great group of guys. And if anybody was to see you yeah. now as compared yeah. to then, they wouldn't yeah. recognize you. Yeah. 
Why? Because you don't look like that in combat. <laughs> yeah. Not, not the smiley face. Different <laughs> story not a jolly together, guy. Dude. Had his own tent. Dude, I'd have to, dude, I'm, oh. Mojo and I lived together. We we were in the same tent. We were, we're, we're not allowed to ride in the same Humvee. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we would get our asses handed to us out there. Yeah, yeah. Armadi was bad. Yeah, because you guys, because then he went over to the other base. Crigador. Yeah, Crigador, when you when the platoon split up. Split up and went over there. He went yeah. over there. Yeah. That was hard on them guys, man. Yeah. Yeah, we had a good group on our base, and then we partner up for some of the missions. Sure. Yeah, so. I remember we kept getting, um, I, I kept doing these write-ups to get the guys work. They always wanted to go out. I'm like, hey, yeah. you want to get, me, get us a mission? I was like, I'm working, I'm working. And then I'll never forget, bro. I ran into the sergeant major who was in charge of actually signing off on our uh, mission yeah. sets. Yeah. And we're at, this, we're at a country western concert. Yeah. And we just happened to start talking about deployments and where we were at. No way. And he goes, he goes, hey, man. He goes, you were running in shark base? You were doing all the mission yeah. write-ups? He yeah. goes, you're the craftiest son of a bitch I ever come across <laughs> in my entire life. He's like, yeah. there's so many different skill. ways you can write up some, right. one thing. One thing. I'd rename it, and just, right. I'd send it up there, and he'd be like, nice try. And I'd be like, no, <laughs> I'll get it. Because then I'd walk out the door, and Wags would be sitting there. He's like, we're going to go work or what? <laughs> and like I said, he didn't look like they was bigger, man. He had his crazy-ass hair, dude. He was just like... And it's Big all the guys, yeah, yeah, all we did was, it was vampire hours. Yeah, so vampire hours. Sleep, eat, and fight. That's it. Sleep, eat, sleep and fight, going up out the next door, oh, wake man. up, go out again. Every, and, all the time. All, all the time, man. It was, uh, yeah, and you never realize, like, you're, you're just uh, you're probably pumped up with so much adrenaline and cortisol. All the time. You know, all the time. So. That's part of why guys get, so when we come home and the yeah. guys immediately go out. Because yeah. it's crazy, because we'd be in Iraq, and then two days later, you're at home. Right, yeah. yeah. It's That's it, probably why they act that way. Yeah, that was such a dream deployment. It was. Know? Yeah. Yeah, and then in like yeah, and then it, I remember you know, and then it, like I would say, any team that comes together, it's like a big vortex of personalities and different people that have some work together, some not, you know. So it like all comes together, you know. And I remember when you came and joined us, like you know, we butted heads for a while, but then right before we deployed, like it was almost like a common enemy, like united you and me, like this other guy in the platoon that like kind of made us both mad. And then like from that day on, man, we were as thick as thieves. I remember that. Yeah. Walked up on that hill. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then, I mean, it's hard to believe that's like been 20 years, you know. Isn't that crazy? Brad. Because <laughs> <laughs> when, when you hear 30 years old in the SEAL teams, that's ancient. We yeah, were talking yeah. about this earlier. Yeah. Like, hey, you're, how old are you? 33? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> you need, do I need to carry your gear for yeah. you? I mean, do I need you to move at 33? Yeah. <laughs> You get uh, your AARP in the SEAL teams, like bro. Yeah. Thirty-three, I was the strongest I ever was, and at forty, I was too, man. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just the mentality, the mindset, the mindset, the, the mentality. Mindset. Yeah, and it's tiring. Like you come back and like you're. It's yeah. exhausting. It's exhausting. It's it's. I mean, I remember even at Ramadi, I think it was like a day ninety. Like I mean, everybody decided, hey, hey, we're gonna have forty-eight hours where we're not either spun up or going out, and just where everybody can just you know rest for forty-eight hours before we go again and. Those 48 hours were awesome. And then we pressed again for the next 90 days super hard, yeah. you know. But, I mean, Ramadi was a, like super high tempo, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, you never feel rest. You never feel, I mean, like when people it's, talk, it like, because most of the times we're in firefights, you know, it's like you've been up. If you're doing a sniper overwatch, you've been up you know the day before and i could never go to sleep bef you know before and then you're inserting at night and then you're at your place and by the time the fighting starts like i mean you've been up probably maybe 24 hours maybe longer and i mean you're tired mm -hmm. you know and then the adrenaline carries you through well, the problem is that the guys around you are like like drugs yeah yeah and it's just like they're fired up you're they're fired it, up it, yeah it, 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 you can go from dead tired to oh right God, and then man it, but yeah it crashed even harder it's, yeah it's crazy yeah and i remember i remember during that time like because uh, you couldn't go out with us all the time right. but i remember when you did go out with us man it was like it was always like a breath of fresh air you know because there was a uh uh kind of like a just a general calmness about everybody when you were there because like if you were now if you're not there then someone's got to step into those leadership, that leadership role. And a lot of times that leadership role was kind of split up between maybe two or three oh, yeah, people. Check. So v versus when you would come out with us, it was just Marcus in that position. And then so, and then when two or three people are trying to fill it, taking stuff, it's just not I'll as much continuity. I owe y'all the fact that y'all, well, I got to go back. Yeah, yeah. And, and just stay in there yeah. was a blessing. I had yeah. to do that for my mind mentally. Right. 
and it beat the crap out. Remember, remember, good luck was when I got into the truck and went to the bathroom everywhere, and I was like, "Hey, Marcus is good. Let's roll, right?" Because it was so cold. We were freezing, man. We oh, had three freezing. layers on, then oh, our yeah. armor, and then guy. If a guy got shot, yeah, then you have to strip him through all that, dude. Yeah. It was, it was rough, man. Oh, but man. it was the coolest thing is when I don't. It, very rarely did anybody get to see what I got to see, but yeah. when we were convoyed up, and I do that startup package. Yeah, yeah. I'd had this cadence that I would do. I was like, okay, light them up, right? Yeah. Talking about the trucks. <laughs> yeah. And then this whole thing, and all yeah. the guys would reply with these 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 certain words. And yeah. I mean, it was the sexiest stuff you ever saw, man. <laughs> yeah, Adam cool. Downs, this guy would keep talking about, he, he would always, he wouldn't wear a helmet. He wore this, um, that baseball cap. Baseball cap. Yeah. <laughs> and he had this cigar yeah. that he had for like three deployments and had duct tape around it. <laughs> And he had it, he kept it he kept it up in the dash of the Humvee. Yeah. And he would chew on it every mission. Yeah. And he'd go, if I as long as I've been chewing on this damn thing, no one's died. Yeah. That's what he said. I mean, this thing was old. Yeah. And it should yeah. be in the Smithsonian. Yeah. Oh it should it should. Yeah. Next to Patton's something and MacArthur's yeah. next to MacArthur's corn yeah. cow pipe, Adam Down's cigar. Yeah. Because he yeah. Everyone got hit. Everyone got hit. Yeah. Everyone in Ramani got got wounded in some capacity. Some. No one made, and some of us got well, hurt real bad. Yeah, because I remember when we were, because uh, you, you put the mobility pack. He, Marcus was part of Manny, and so before when you do the thing where everyone was sitting in the deal. So I was in vehicle one when we rolled out of, um, I think it was Cop Sword or whatever. And then that's when I hit that IED. I remember. Yeah, I was there. You were the vehicle commander. I, I mean, was. The, I sure was. The, I was right behind you. Yeah, you're the man. And uh, I remember when that thing went off because. That our whole front of our vehicle went up. It looked, yeah. I, what does I, it look like from I, your perspective? I, oh, bro, <laughs> what? It it got my attention so freaking fast because I was looking over at the driver and I turned back around. And you know when you look like when a sparkler goes off, yeah, when yeah. you first light it and they all fall down like that. Yeah. Imagine one of those the size of a Humvee. Yeah. That's what you look like in front of me. Really? Sparkler okay. like that, and it got dead because our normal protocols is for everything to go dead quiet. Yeah. Immediately, so I. Yeah. Everyone can figure out and have a couple minutes. And then, yeah. you know, I come over, I'm like, report, right? Yeah. And then <laughs> we're good. Oh, dude, I, you want to talk about... Yeah. I felt real bad about that one, man. Yeah. Well, I, thought, I took the blame for that because I pulled us out early. Well, I, no, I, so I... Yeah, I, I, I talk about this uh, sometimes I, when I talk about complacency kills, you know. what It wasn't you pulling out early. What We were all talking about, we had all had a long Everybody day. wanted to leave, and Every, I fell for it. And, and, like, and I, we... Yeah, and we were like a five minute I'll drive. I'll never from forgive camp. myself for that. Five minute drive from camp, and what? Looking at that spot all day. Yeah, like well, we were looking at the spot we got hit at all day. So, because I remember, like, I was faced the other direction, and I remember the SOG came up, and uh, uh, and he and I, I remember I stood up to stretch my back, and where we got hit, there were three Bradleys, but That's they right. had Iraqi working parties That's right. there, and then and then I remember one group they did they looked like just like they were doing something, something that they yeah, shouldn't right be doing, around. and I asked the SOG, I go, I know you got a Bradley ten feet away from, him, but some, you don't know if the guys in the Bradley are watching or whatever, you can't see them, so I was like, uh, and there's no windows in that, there's thing. no windows in that thing, so I was like, I go, I go, I know they're got to be working for you, you know, but those guys. Uh, it just looked like they were, you know, they're kind of like looking around when they're doing stuff. And the other working parties were, you know, doing everything they're doing. Anyway, he goes, yeah, hey, I'll go check it out and get back to you. Well, then I remember at dinner when we were like grabbing some to eat and everybody was like, hey, let's get home. And there's a whole bunch of people that were ranked higher than you. I could have said something, you know, um, da, da, da. And, and we'd all just, we all kind of decided collectively like, hey, God, we've been out there for a while. For a while. Let's get it. back uh, early. Da, da. Uh, so and um and that was against our SOPs because you know we we hadn't let Pathfinder come I through and through clear there. all the stuff. So anyway, we got in uh, the vehicles and I was vehicle one. I'll never forget that thing goes up in a fireball. <laughs> the vehicle comes off. The, I mean, in front of the vehicle comes off the ground. A Humvee. A Humvee. <laughs> up, up, up armored. Up, up armored. armored. <laughs> and, uh, serious armor on this. Serious up here. armor on the thing. Um, just freaking yeah. Like so a when you start, when they started it and started driving it, we made it out the over. gate. The, the <laughs> last vehicle wasn't even out of the gate yet. We were vehicle. I was vehicle one. And I was right behind him. Yeah, and he was vehicle three. And then uh, when the vehicle came down, I remember, I remember the first thing I did because I had such a shot of adrenaline go through my veins, and I had heard these stories of guys who had lost their legs and were trying to re get up and return fire, and they didn't realize until God, we were in this they had channelized down. area too man. yeah channelized area so i just remember the first thing i did was because i had so much adrenaline and, I, and it was at night and i was on nods i remember wondering if i had my legs still and i was like patting them down with my gloves you know, like if, if you think you're wounded or don't know you try to pat down everywhere and see if you got blood 
you know, and uh, it was so bright. Everyone was on yeah, the nods, and it right. was, the flame was so bright, everyone right. went blind. Yeah. So then, so then, uh, and, who was with you? Uh, there were five guys in our vehicle because we had our EOD mm. guy, we had the gunner, we had the uh, so the uh, EOD guy didn't check the EOD out? guy was back here. No, it, he was hard, it would have been hard yeah, for him to see. His job is different, yeah, it's yeah. His thing. And so, when we came down, I remember though, we everybody was really calm in our vehicle, you know, and and no one was screaming or yelling. So, and we were just asked like, Hey, is everybody okay? And everyone, and everyone was like, like really calm. And, uh, cause it happened so fast. Like a lot of people don't know this about explosives, but like our fastest sniper rifle shoots about 3000 feet per second. And an explosive goes somewhere around 12,000 to 25,000 feet per second. Wow. So a slow explosive would be like 12,000. So on average, probably like 17, 18,000 feet per second. You know, when your fastest sniper rifle shoots about 3000, that's the power of explosives. So then, um, and then we were all, everyone was really calm and everyone, no one uh, uh, was injured in some type of penetrating wound. So then everyone's like, okay. And then Marcus comes across, you know, calms. He's like, vehicle one. You know, <laughs> you know I knew everybody was okay. They were laughing. <laughs> yeah. We were like, I, heard, I could hear them laughing in the background. Yeah. Cause we were like, uh, I go, <laughs> that's how I knew. I was like, oh shit, let's get out of here. Cause we were, we were still in the X, right? There was yeah. just two. We were, but our vehicle was disabled. It was so completely blown it was up. Disabled. So then, uh. Uh, we were all looking like, who wants to take this, right? So uh, I'll go like, oh yeah, Marcus, this vehicle one, we're we're all right, dude. That's yeah. when Mott stepped up, came yeah, around that house the and pushed he, that vehicle he did an out. Incredible he did job, a great job, great job. Because you had to weave, you had to push a vehicle and weave it through the uh, barrier, like a slalom course like a kind of deal. Course. Set up, man. Yeah. He freaking he did on that. Nod, dude. On nods did that. That, that was, was awesome. Incredible. I remember being very impressed. Yeah, him. I was impressed. With impressed as shit when he did that. Yeah, because it's not like you've practiced that whole month at all, at all. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, that good was, job, Mods. That's I forgot about that. Yeah, you did a great job. But yeah, that was a really. We were out there for seven, six months, seven se months, yeah, seven, six months. Or seven months. So we got there in late September, early October, and then left in uh, middle, middle to April, I think. Where'd you go after that? So after that, I went back. Hold on. Was anyone hurt in the, in the? In that one, in, in that one, in that no, no, just no I mean, that, that one was. Everyone you know, always got hurt. It got to a yeah. point where everyone was get hurt like that, and we just kind of. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but that, like no amputees or anything like not that. On that not, not, for, not, not on, on that, that one. one. But I remember, uh, you know, when you go on any missions and you go check the manual board where you are, mobility or assault. That was and Marcus I knew was in charge of that, and that was the last time I was ever in Vehicle One. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So, uh, and then um, yeah, and then we were just out all the time. Just uh, I mean, very violent. And then the after, only oh, you know, the only people that didn't get touched. Yeah, two point men. Oh yeah! No, until the end, Stott got shot in the chest. He got shot in the chest by a, by a firefight. Firefight that, was, that wasn't even with us. It wasn't with us. It was over. The bullets were subsonic yeah. when they hit him. I of, mean, we were coming home the next day. Yeah, we were getting, all our stuff was packed up, and yeah. he got shot in the chest. And like, because I remember Mount. Is he okay? He's a firefighter in Denver. Firefighter in Denver. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, yeah, he's great. His, yeah. his X-ray is awesome. Oh, is I it? mean, there was literally a uh, seven-six-two round, and then you can see there. his spine. He yeah. came to the ranch. It looks like his spine yeah. is like the barrel of a gun, yeah. and then the seven-six-two rounds. Right, yeah, he did. Really? It's right there. Oh, it's still ass. in there. Can't, can't get it. Can't get it. And it was badass. Yeah, yeah. He was Charlie found guy. him laying on the ground. Yeah, because Charlie, he was right outside our tent, and uh, he had his headphones, headphones in, in yeah. and he was, you know. Walking and then Charlie walks up to him because he's laying on the ground holding his chest because the bullets were subsonic. It was from a firefight across the river that we didn't even hear in our camp. Yeah. But we, but we didn't know that at the time, so we thought somebody had maybe gotten to our camp, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we were, went and cleared Probably everything. Went and then, uh, but I remember like Charlie goes up to him, he's like, "What are you doing?" He's right. rolling on the ground. He's like, I "Country, hate country." He's like, "Hey man, what are you doing down there, man?" What are you doing? <laughs> and he goes, uh, and he goes, typical like, Charlie fashion, yeah. dude. Yeah, and he goes, I think I got hit by someone threw a rock, rock and hit me. Yeah. He looks and he's like, you've been shot. He goes, no, bro, you've yeah. been shot. So they had to rush him down, oh which was, wasn't the fact, like, it was still a 10-minute drive yeah. from where we were yeah. to the to the medical tent wow. on base. That's right. It was on the other side of base. Yeah, it was on the other side of base. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so it was, uh, and you're just basically, th we're throwing them in one of our trucks. I'm sure that wasn't a fun ride for him because we're on those dirt oh, bumpy roads, not. you know. That's terrible. But uh, yeah, Greg, and we were literally all he our was, stuff was packed up. The only thing we still had out was our operational gear, you know, because we're going to go to safety. You know, yeah, yeah, safety, and that was it. Everything was else was on the pallets and most of Don and Sean. Sean, Sean yeah. Greg Dallas, dude, yeah. he's freaking great. Well, that one time, <laughs> do you remember that one time we're in the op in Ramadi, and uh, Andy was the UD guy in the front. Stodden is the point man, and we're coming back after we did a basically a snatch and grab DA hit, um, uh, and, and captured a couple of HVTs, and we're walking back to the base that we had uh, not our base, but a different parked base at, we yeah. had parked at, yeah, parked at, 
And uh, Stodden sees a couple things in the ground on the path that don't look natural, like, you know, da-da. And as he steps over him, he shines his IR light and goes, man, he's saying to the EOD guy, man, that doesn't look right. As he steps over him and Andy looks at it and he grabs everybody and he's like, everybody hold. And he brings Stodden very carefully back over. And then they pushed us all like two or 300 yards back. And I remember, it was, see, it was still dark out at this time. And then he brought the other EOD guy and we just took security positions where we were around. And then it took them. I mean, I remember the sun came up and everything. Right. We we're still waiting. And they had found two IEDs that were on that road and so that they were going to detonate them right there. You know, um, and, you know, we by this time we'd been out all night. Now the sun's up. And so when they blew those things, then we walked by them again. I remember it looked like you could put a Humvee in each of the holes. Oh, my yeah. gosh. You know? So it was uh, – and, and uh, you know, I mean, Stodden saw that, you know, and then Andy – and all those guys, uh, you know, took care of it. But man, yeah, you... I never really thought about it till now, man. But I never rotated them off the front. Yeah. <laughs> like, Oops. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I mean, it was the worst place on the planet. You go first. <laughs> you go first. Yeah, but, it, but it's so, like, but also like they're they were the best at it. They were the best. Yeah. So it's like they're the best. When you have people like that, you know, uh, and for mo- the most part, our infills and our exfills. Weren't super crazy. Yeah, well, you know, I'm trying to make those smooth as, yeah, as possible. Yeah, make them smooth as possible, you know, because we would go to some place from a Ford operating place in the city and then go hit it kind of from there, you know. But I mean, we, I mean still some good tracks, but. Um, we go on a boat sometimes, oh, up we, the river. And they never, we never got picked up once. I remember okay. we were doing yeah, that three weird. day overwatch from boats, like up there in the shark fin or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the shark they fin. dropped us off on the boat, and that's when we had that blue on blue situation mm-hmm. where uh, the, army, the army, the army lit us up. Uh, we got shot out a lot by the army. Yeah, we got shut up. And, My God. And then, yeah. and then the, and Just, then that's, that's the fact. And we all took cover Down in, in, the, in yeah. the ditch. Yeah, and then they were shooting up you know, the flares <laughs> to tell them, like, hey, you know, we're friendlies and everything like that. And we had deconflicted with them all the way through on our it's, calls. It's really, Something had not gotten to the... So what happens yeah. is, is, like, one the one guy will pass it to the next guy in the tower, and the tower will be watching, but then another guy will take his watch. Watch, yeah. And then another guy will take his watch. Oh right. Gosh. They would pass it down, and then we so, come bebopping in. Yeah, so if someone didn't pass it down or ride it That's down. usually how it happened to yeah. us. Are you ready to level up your savings and handle finances like a boss? Go check out Navy Federal Credit Union and boost your savings game with Navy Federal's top-notch certificate options. Unlike other banks, Navy Federal offers a wide variety of saving choices tailored just to you. All you need to do to start off is with a small deposit and sit back and watch your savings grow effortlessly. With flexible terms, Navy Federal's options fit any timeline and if you're thinking about home upgrades or you're consolidating debt, you can borrow up to 100% of your home's equity with no closing costs. Navy Federal makes handling big expenses so easy. You can learn all about this and more at NavyFederal.org. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Go visit NavyFederal.org for more details. Navy Federal is insured by the NCUA, Equal Housing Lender, Membership is required, terms and conditions apply, and loans are subject to approval. Yeah. Okay, so after that, you continued, Marcus retired shortly after that, yeah. and then you continued. So then I, the yeah. Teams. Yeah, so then I was in my next platoon. Um, and then that's, I remember when you and Peter Berg came out to Nyland and you guys were going to follow our platoon around for a little bit. You guys came out to a couple of blocks of our training, S and R. You can't believe how much that helped. Yeah. Having you out there with yeah. a couple of those other, from the, from Alpha. Yeah. When we, when we were doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, it yeah. went over too. Yeah. You want to talk about that? When Pete went over with y'all? Yeah. Oh, right, oh yeah. I got hurt on that deployment. So when Pete came over, I had already been sent home because I was in a vehicle rollover where I had shattered my right wrist and had a level five shoulder separation on my left side. So I was like in the Al Assad hospital for that happened on like December. I was in the hospital for like 10 days. And then I tried to get just healthy enough to where they could ship me back, you know? So Dude, yeah, that sucks, man. I'm sorry yeah. you had to go through that. Yeah, that. That took my wrist about, I mean, a year and a half to come, come back. I mean, it's still, you know, it's, it's as, you know, it, it's come back really far, but like at first they were like, Oh, you'll never, we still you know, five. <clears throat> yeah, that yeah that deployment I was at five because the guy was the LPO became chief and then I became the LPO right, and then we, it was December but that by that time it was oh eight oh nine 
uh, that we were over there and things had really changed, you know, like we, we went everywhere on at night, like on white lights, you know, which was just an uncomfortable feeling. And we had the big RGs by this time. So you were way up high in the vehicle and, and stuff like that. But it was a very, we were kind of like out on the Syrian border. For the most part, it was a, a, a pretty quiet deployment. And that's the one I get, you know, heard on, heard on you know, and then, and then, uh, that's usually when all team guys get jacked up. Oh, it's crazy, man. When there's nothing going on. Yeah. And then so when I came back from that, uh, you know, I'm healing up and everything. So, And at this time, too, I'm supposed to rotate into instructor school. So I rotate in and I become like a... I always like, wanted to do that. Yeah. <laughs> the instructor? I always wanted to do that. Really? Yeah, at the end. Yeah, at the end. We did the platoon, got our yeah. asses kicked. I kind of wanted to rotate in and then yeah. the school route and do yeah. all that. That's like a perfect life. Well, I had been planning my rollout to where I wanted to go for a long time. So I, I, I taught RSO and dive suit. Oh, Yeah, dude. which were, you know, cake. It, it was like pretty easy because I just... I, I didn't have to do oh. JT on the job training. Think about that as your job in life. Oh, like you get to go awesome. into, you're in the Navy. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You get to teach people how to scuba dive <laughs> yeah. and, and, and what? Jump it's, on an airplanes? Yeah, safe, safety, safety stuff. Rug, yeah. The safety part of yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, and then I was trying to study for the bar. And I, so I was like, I go, I'm going to study for, uh, when you study for the law school bar, like the, the bar to become an attorney, I go, you know, so I started, I, I bought a Kaplan course, which cost me half my month's pay at the time. And then, uh, and then I go through the course and I go, I'll go, and then I sign up for, to take the bar exam and I, and as a practice, right? I go, let me take it. And then compared to the course that I took, I thought the test was a lot easier because the fact patterns in the Kaplan course were just so much longer. Yeah, so I was like, okay, that gave me a lot of confidence. And I'm like, okay, I, now for the next one, I'm going to really drill down and, uh, and, uh, and, and do all the subjects versus just the few that I studied. Mm -hmm. And it was during that time, it was funny because. I get a call at like 7.30 in the morning by my warrant officer. And uh, and he calls, he goes, Wags, as soon as you get in today, come to my office. And it sounded serious. So like, yeah. and we don't even have like that many, many serialized items in our thing. I was, like, I was like, guys, is our inventory up? Are we good? And, and they're like, uh, and I had two guys that worked with me and they're like, they're like, uh, yeah, we're good. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go see the warrant. I don't know what this is about, but like, you know, yeah. uh, I was like, so I walked. It's like going to the principal. Yeah, yeah. So I go to the principal. So. I walk in like, I was like, hey, Warren, how's it going? You Here's know? some coffee. Yeah. Here's some donuts. Oh, what do you need, donuts, bro? Need. Good yeah. day. How's yeah. things at home? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I could tell by the way he greeted me, he wasn't mad at with or upset about anything. Like, he goes, oh, hey, Wags, come on in here. And it's just me and him in the room, right? And his office, come in here, have a seat. How's everything going? I go, oh, it's going great. How's how's the instruction going to school? Any problems? Like, no, no, everything's going. He's like, okay, good. Good to know. He goes, listen, I got an issue. Um, the command has to send someone to Afghanistan. And it's got to be somebody in this room. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, Who said that? <laughs> uh, I'm going to forget his last. I'll, oh, I'll remember dude. Yeah, he goes, he goes, and I'm like looking around. It's just me and him in the room. Oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to Afghanistan. He goes, I have to have a volunteer. It's got to be somebody in this room. And I go, I'm going. I go, when do I leave? He goes, you leave in 40 days. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> yeah, Good thanks job. for volunteering. Yeah. So then he goes back. I found out later from the master chief because the master chief's all in charge of uh, Every, yeah. uh, Manning, you know. And so he goes to the warrant officer and he goes, hey, did you find a volunteer to go to Afghanistan? He goes, he goes, yeah. He goes, Wags came into my office um, and I was telling him that uh, we needed somebody to go to Afghanistan. He looked me right in the eye and said, I'm going to Afghanistan. <laughs> I'm your guy. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Send me. Yeah, I go. He goes, I'm going to Afghanistan. And so Master Chief came up and he later is like, hey, thanks for volunteering, Wags. Really appreciate you. That's a step way, way to be a step yeah. up guy, man. And I, and I, was, like, I was like, oh, confused. dude, like, that's a warrant for yeah. you right there, yeah. man. <laughs> Use cars. They don't give a damn either. They don't even give a damn. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, man. So uh, so I had 40 days, and then uh, and I was trying to get all my stuff ready and prepped. And then uh, and it ended up being one of the best things because I had never been to Afghanistan yet. I had done my three deployments to Iraq. And, and when I was even thinking about when I was getting ready to take the bar, and, and I only had a couple of years left, that I was going to be on instructor duty the whole time, I remember feeling like my only regret is that I didn't get a chance to go to Afghanistan. That's you right. Know? I get and, you. And so anyway, I got over there. Uh, I was first over there. We were doing NSOAG, Afghan Special Operations. Oh, you got put on that? Yeah, we were a joint task force. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and we, we had a bunch of great guys that worked with us. Um, and it, it was there was aspects of the job because we were trying to build up the Afghan military, their special forces and, and commandos. And there was stuff that was really, really hard, you know, because we were supposed to let them, you know, do everything yeah, and everything yeah. like that. And. And so I often sometimes say, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're taking countries through 
our 1770s, our, our, our 1860s, and our 1960s, all in a 10 to 20 years, right? And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big kind of like melting pot trying to get everything and everybody work together, you know, and overcome differences and, and move forward in, uh, in different cultures and, and really come together for a joint mission. And, um, and sitting on, and so we're like in the rooms where they're talking and briefing, like if we were all briefing and stuff, you know, but we're supposed to sit on the side and kind of help them coach them, but let them make all the decisions and everything mm-hmm. like that. So it was, um, uh, it was, it was, it had its very challenging aspects. It had its extremely rewarding aspects about it. Uh, some of the things that they had done and put together that were incredible. Their, their commando school was awesome. Uh, they were, it was all run by Afghans and they were kind of based off the army Rangers yeah. and, and the training they put those guys through was really, really good. So that was impressive. And then, uh, they were still had a long way to go on the special forces program. And you know, that, that was all run by, uh, coalition forces. Um, and they still had a long go on that, but it, it was like great signs of hope and great signs of people coming together and, and some great signs of them, you know, uh, taking command and doing some really cool things. And then, of course, some frustrations, just like we have in the military yeah. and stuff like that. But uh, I had done that, and then I asked to go extend, um, you know, because I was uh, basically liaison at that point, and I asked to extend and go to the VSO ops. And uh, I'm going to forget the Master Chief's name, but I just said, I go, hey, does anybody at the VSO ops, those stability operations, need any help? And he's like, looked at me like, you know, I was like, oh, yeah. He goes, if you want to go somewhere, he goes, that's not a problem. So... Then I went out there uh, into the Argandov Valley, uh, which is uh, like out in Zabul province. Um, and our the, the, the area that we worked out of kind of looks like uh, like Palm Springs Mountains and stuff like that, kind of like not Nylon, like not much vegetation except by the rivers. And then everything was kind of like bare, rocky mountain, yeah. right? So, uh, and then we lived in a village kulat, like the Afghans live, like the mud huts, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, and I, I was so happy out there, man. And really? I, yeah, great group of guys. I was augmenting SEAL Team 10 and just, I had a lot of fun. Now it was, it was like 10 times the work, like in Ramadi, like you could just go walk out your front door, like out there you had to like, you know, go up mountain ranges oh, and yeah. come down and, you know, go through really rough territory. Cause I'll never forget the first time on my very first op, like, I mean, I'm over, oh, loading up on water and we're going on this big infill and I'm going to climb like this, you know, big mountain and stuff like that. And this is my first time. They've been operating together for like, you know, nine or 10 months and I'm an individual augmentee. So blah, blah. So I remember we're going on there and they had, you know, at the beginning of the mission, they go, Hey, put all these points in your, in your GPS. Right. You know, uh, you know, at the bridge that we're going to cross the river, all this stuff. We come up to the area on this first stop and we're kind of like in this, uh, some vegetation and, and uh, this is the point on the GPS where it says, like, okay, we're about to cross the bridge. Well, I go up on my nods and I see the river. It's like this rushing, you know, river. And, you know, we're probably like 10, 12, 15 feet above the river, but I don't see a bridge. So I like, I see the guys, I go, I go, hey, guys, I go, I go, where is the, is the bridge up there? And, you know, they've done this a bunch of times. Like, yeah, wait, bridge is right up there. So, like, <clears throat> I still don't see the bridge I'm looking for. I, and I, so I go up to somebody else to go, hey, he's, you know, I'm trying to get a, se- a second opinion. I go, is, is a bridge here? And like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, wait, the uh, bridge is right up there. So then I finally, I go, I get closer and I go, I go, so I, I go, I'm still looking for it. And I go, I go, hey man, I can't, is there, where's the bridge? And the guy goes, Wax, takes me up and there's like a log that's not even a big log. Yeah. It's like it's like uh, something that looks like it's definitely not going to hold my weight, especially over there right this long right here that they had put over this yeah, river right there. And I'm thinking, and now I know why you have yeah. the rolling logs on the obstacle course. Yeah, because th- this this log was probably maybe half or quarter of the size of what those rolling logs yeah, were. Telephone pole. Yeah, yeah, oh my and, gosh. and and we have all. I got all my gear on. Like I got my sniper rifle on my back. I'm got my body armor on. I got all my weapon. You know, so. I'm weighing a good 350 or whatever, right? With all my gear, maybe more, maybe around 400 pounds. And so uh, I'm like thinking to myself, oh man, I hope I don't fall off into the river. (laughs) And so like, I was like, got on that thing. You're just like kind of going across, you know? And I was like, this thing's going to break, but luckily it held my weight. So. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Team guys, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Don't worry. There's a bridge. (laughs) There's a bridge. Engineering battalion is just here. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Oh, it was funny. Cause I was like, how long was that deployment? That so that one was a whole year, the whole that's year right. VSO was like, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Well, the, well, the VSO that I was out with them was like, I think I was out there with them for a hundred days, and I was at the other place for like seven months or so, like that. Yeah, I remember. So, did you um, ever take the bar? 
No, because when I came back, so that was, I was, I, I took my practice bar probably in the summer of 2000, um, uh, 10. And then it was, I got the call from the warrant in like maybe October of 2010. And then, so from there I just dropped everything and then I deployed in January and then I came home in December of 2011. Yeah. And then by that time I only had eight months left. And by that time I was just tired. And I just thought to myself, like I, I didn't, I had lost my motivation for the bar and everything like that. And I just like, you know what, I'm just going to ride this out and, uh, get done with it. I will say the Navy put me out on, push put me out like my last 24 days in the of active duty in the navy they sent me over to uh pearl harbor to sv team to teach an rso and dive soup course and uh rim pack was going on at the time oh bro so so there was no place to stay on base so they had to put me up in a condo downtown honolulu so, <laughs> it's hard duty oh hard duty it's yeah. hard living yeah. man somebody's oh, got to do it though so i was there like those for, are the great breaks in the team oh those are the great breaks they happen yeah. all the time they happen all the time because they had to find a place for me they, and they will put yeah. you i've known guys get put in mansions right and, and get stuck somewhere from i got stuck somewhere for months and yeah, it's just yeah. a good be and that's when team guys won't say nothing yeah yeah oh no they won't say fine. nothing yeah be like, because the lady nothing, was like right. she felt so bad for me that was trying to help me that worked you know trying to help find a place for me. It's like i'm so sorry we can't find you in a place i'm looking for something in town even in town it's really hard so i ended up staying in like this super nice <laughs> condo it's like this is all i could find i'm like i'll do i'll be all right yeah. <laughs> i'll do my best man yeah i'll do my best <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's gonna be tough yeah that's so funny you know i yeah i'll so, be i'll keep in touch yeah God, that was dude, that was my last great. 24 days because when i came back from that and re turned in all my gear i went on terminal leave so you didn't think about being a jag no. Did you ever think about that? I never I, asked you that when we were in. Yeah, no, I uh, I will say this: going through law school, because you know when we get the briefs from the Jags and people, and the, they just come in and they say, "Hey, if you're in reasonable fear for your life, you can, uh, you, you 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 don't have to wait till someone shoots you. you. Like if you're in reasonable fear of an immediate threat to your life, then you know you're you're can engage, you, yeah. you can engage. And so in law school, you get you know a, a, a gazillion cases on what a reasonable threat means right where people thought somebody had a gun but they didn't sure. but the the all the fact patterns show that they had a reasonable threat but in the seal teams like really what happens in your training is when we do our training really everything is to not a reasonable certainty but really a lot of it's to an absolute certainty right so think when you're running through the kill house super fast right like unknown versus hostile and everything yeah. that you're doing really quick and in reality you know all you need is a reasonable certainty you know you want to be sure Right. But there's very few things in life that are absolutely, absolutely sure. Fair, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, so that one of the things that law school taught me that I tried to like tell guys all the time as we're going through training and doing different things. I go, guys, like, you know, it's a reasonable certainty, not an absolute certainty. You know, um, I remember that being the best thing in Ramadi. Yeah. After the ops, I was in there doing the shooter statements. Shooter statements we get these yeah. gunfights yeah. and I have to fill them out and I get a wag. Take a look at this. Yeah, I guess so. Will this will this pass? And they're like, yeah, it's good. So we'd send it up the chain of command, yeah. and we'd come back down sometimes. We're like, Wax, take another yeah, look at yeah, it. Yeah, we, we had a great job. I need some lawyer, yeah. litigious, yeah. whatever that word is, advice. Yeah, because it's like you're kind of, you know, you're going through all your, uh, you know, protocol when you're. In Matter of fact, he stuff. said that to me. Yeah. That, the sergeant major's like, do you have a lawyer? Yeah, did he? In your platoon? I'm like, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> That's right. He said that to me, man. Yeah. yeah so it was. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, yeah, because there's a lot of different situations, man, where you're out there where, I mean, you know, war, and especially our war, like where people didn't wear uniforms, it's very much in the gray, you know, and so. And we're a part of anything, just be pissed off one day. Yeah, yeah. But and if it, someone had a bad day in there, they could go take it out on us. Yeah. That, that's, that's different than fighting an army. Yeah, so we, uh, yeah, so, you know, it, you know, getting through there and then doing that. And so, yeah, when I really came back, I was just, whatever, you know, on that platoon, I was just tired. You know, and I was just like, I didn't have any, uh, <clears throat> like, oh man, let me go take the bar and everything. So then I kind of really didn't know what I was going to go do, you know? And then what was wild is that that's when I like went up and I went and visited my buddy in New York, my same close friend who had lost his brother in nine 11, who's still one of my best friends to this day. Um, and, uh, and then I went up to Catskill and trained up there for a couple of days while I was on terminal leave. And I told him, I go, Hey, I'm going to come back here after I sign up in the reserves and, and, uh, knock out my reserve time. I'm going to come back. Right. So, uh, and then it took me a while because I had to jump through all the things in the reserves and do all the protocols. And then I had to negotiate with them to do all my training 
in one huge block for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I got up there, it was March of 2013, you know, and then I came up and I was so happy. And Catskill, New York's like a little, little small town, mm -hmm. right? So my, where my apartment was to like the Walmart where I did all my mm -hmm. shopping to the, to the weight gym that I lifted to the gym where I was training boxing, you know, like was all like one mile apart from each other. And then I had two couple of trainers or whatever. And then we would, uh, you know, after we trained for a while, we'd start going out to New York city, uh, and spark some of the gyms down there, you know, and I just had so much fun. And that was like, it was uh, like, I, one of the things about boxing gyms that I absolutely love is, you know, anybody can walk into a boxing gym from any walk of life. <clears throat> and if they apply themselves, do all those things, they can go from wherever they come from off the street or whatever, or from, you know, those, and they can, reach the upper echelon of the sport where most sports you have to be drafted by a team, right? Most, most professional well, you sports, get you can't even get up. Right. It's, it's too expensive. You, right. Right. So you, you, you can't, you can't pay for what you need to do what you need. Boxing is a very simple sport, a gloves, a place to hit the bag, a place to spar. So you and, get so much and, out of it too, though. Oh, you get so much out of it. It's such a, I have and not just learn how to fight either or defend yourself. There's so much right. more that goes into that. Yeah. And it's such a stress reliever. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. And so by this time I had like a certain amount of money that I had left because we, I had made one bad, um, me and another seal buddy who's still, I think over at six, uh, we had bought a house together in 05, you know, right before the crash. And when the crash happened, I mean, we got crushed. Mm. And so like, I was like, and we weren't we weren't missing any payments because he said if we miss payments our credit will won't be able to recover for years or maybe never. And I go I'm not going to have one dime left in the bank if we don't short are able to short sell this as fast as possible. So eventually we short sold it, but <clears throat> that's the thing about that's you know one of the things in the military is if like you make one bad investment you know and uh, that you think is going to be a home run because there were guys that were flipping houses all the time on the side on the teams and they were making tons, tons of, of money. money yeah so then we felt like we were i was like we're the fools man we need to get in on this and like we got in on it like at the tail end you yeah. know but uh yeah so like it would have taken me years to recover from that financially so but like when i went up to Caskill to box for a while i had a certain amount of money i was willing to put towards it you know and once i uh got to that thing where i was like okay i need to you know go start working um, but it was such a fun time for me because all I did every day was get up, eat, box, work out. It's a great place to be. Yeah, it was a great place to be. That's a great place yeah. to live, man. Yeah. And then that, that life, that yeah, lifestyle. That lifestyle. It was great. So confidence can be a real roller coaster, right? Sometimes soaring high and other times not quite hitting the mark where it counts. That's where Hims comes into play by offering discreet and affordable solutions for sexual health all online. Their clinically proven alternatives to Viagra and Cialis are up to 95% cheaper, some just as low as $2 a dose. Answer a few quick questions and your tailored treatment is on its way. No insurance required and one low price covers it all, treatments, visits, and deliveries. And here's the real kicker. Besides the, um, <clears throat> performance benefits. Another awesome perk I've noticed is my beard has been growing in much, much fuller, and I've got to admit my hair is looking better and more luscious than ever. It is pretty incredible. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash TNQ. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash TNQ for your personalized treatment options. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider, ensuring safety and appropriateness. Check the website for details. Subscription may be required with pricing based on the product and plan. Your confidence starts here with Hems. And then uh, that's when around that time I had a friend at the SOCOM Care Coalition provider that worked there. It was a former SEAL that I had befriended. And I forgot how we had got connected but then he sent me a thing on the gary sneeze foundation and he goes hey this came across my desk and it was uh it was you know kind of like a job description for a position that they were looking for <clears throat> and they just said uh um uh you know like you're the only person i thought of you know and so i was like all right so so i remember calling them so I, now i'm planning to kind of move back and by this time i'd probably been up there seven or eight months now i'm planning to come back across the west coast and then about this same time that I was planning that to, I think you had reached out to me about Patriot Tour. Because mm -hmm. now it's like end of 2013. Mm -hmm. started we actually did a, a Patriot Tour 
in 2013. Oh, did you? Okay. We did one yeah. before you came on. Yeah. Yeah. So that one, when you guys had reached out or we got connected or you guys started telling me about it, or I think I came out and maybe when did you do the uh, 60 minute interview? Uh, that would have been 2014. 14? 2014. Mm -hmm. Early 2014? 13. 13. 13. Because when, when that was going on, you asked me to come out. So I flew out there and you guys flew me out that's to right. yeah be there for the weekend. And then uh, that's when like, uh, uh, yeah, Anderson Cooper was out here and stuff doing the yeah, interview with right. you. Yeah. So I think it was at that time that you guys were telling me about Patriot Tour or something mm -hmm. like that. And maybe. Um, yeah. Because I remember that. And that was a really. Chris died that year. Chris died uh, February. It was supposed to start and it got pushed to the right because yeah, of that. Yeah. It um taya ended up taking chris's spot and it was the, so he died in february and i think our first show was in like august maybe uh, okay I yeah that was back, predated me then yeah. yeah yeah so then when i came back or you guys flew me out for that 60 minute thing and then um mm -hmm. and then i came back then we uh that's when you guys were telling me about patriot tour so then i signed up with that because i didn't know if the gary like you know i knew i was going to do these interviews with the gary scenes foundation but i didn't know how it was going to work out yet so and I remember going through that interview process and I, it was funny because I was just, uh, they just had me on GSF, like they have like all the staff and everybody that works with and all their, you know, a lot of their partners on uh, these calls every like one month, once and they'll take a speaker and talk about it, you know. So I, I, when they brought me on there, I go, I challenge anybody to have to, to have had to jump through all the hoops that I did to, you know, work there because I had an interview by phone with the executive director at the time and then she had me come in to the office and then I had another interview at the office where I met different members of the team there. Then they said they were about to do this inspiration. Uh, you know, Gary's got his band, Lieutenant yeah. Dan Man. They were about to do a, a, a concert over at Balboa. So she asked me to come up there. And it was kind of funny because when I got there, um, she uh, uh, they kind of like left me, I think, to see how I'd interact with everybody. And I had already known some guys from the C5 unit because uh, our got my... Our, our guy in Af one of our, our EOD guys in Afghanistan, we lost uh, Caleb Nelson on a mission and Andrew Betrello was next to him, became a triple amputee. And so I had gone to see Andrew at the C5 unit in Balboa, you know, and so I had got to meet some of the other wounded veterans. So I knew some of them that were there. And then uh, I had, I remember I had, this was right around Valentine's Day of uh, 2014. So I remember me and Gary had a dinner on uh, Valentine's Day of 2014 at a steak restaurant. How wonderful. <laughs> How wonderful. <laughs> so How great is that man? <laughs> yeah, so he, romantic. He is, yeah. right? He is. I don't know. I don't I've personally met him yet, yeah. but I know he's our Bob Hope. Oh, he is. He's our Bob Hope. And I mean, he's an incredible, incredible man. I'll never forget that dinner because I went and ate dinner. I've always heard that. Yeah. I, he is. He is. I went and ate dinner before the dinner, so I wouldn't be hungry at the dinner. It's good you know? thinking. Yeah, was, yeah I, I do this a couple of times. I'll go eat if it's. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, because now I'm not hungry and I'm thinking about food. Yeah, I don't remember even at the dinner. He's like, yeah. "Are you gonna eat anything?" I'm like, "I was like, Gary, I'm here to meet with you. I'll go I'll nibble on some stuff." But um, but I, I remember even when I was having gobbling up the them. knowledge. Yeah, gobbling up the knowledge and connecting with them. And I remember he he put his hand on my shoulder at one point in the dinner, and he goes, he goes, he goes, "I want you to know." how important this work is to me. You know, he goes, this is my heart and soul, what I'm pouring my heart and soul into, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember it just resonated with me, you know, like uh, like how uh, important this was to yeah. me. Yeah, so then he, uh, so, then, so then we went to the concert, which was the next day, and then the next day, him and I had a lunch at uh, Danny's. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah, so now we're- Slam burger. Slam burger, yeah. So we're sitting in the back there and, uh, and so we're talking and, and now I'm kind of getting nervous cause I need a job. I, 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 number one, I need a job. I really wanted this job and then I didn't know what else to say or do. And now I've had like four interviews by this time. Right. Take him to Danny's. Yeah. Take him <laughs> yeah. So we're sitting there, we get a hamburger and then he goes, uh, and at this time there's only five or six people that work at the foundation. And he was, you know, and he wanted to make sure I was right for the job. So he goes, I tell you what, he goes, I want you to write, uh, basically an essay on, um, I want it, half of it to be so that you know what we've done at, at the foundation, and my history of working with veterans. And I go, I'll help you with that. We'll send you some material on that so you know, because you're going to be representing me a lot when you go to these things. You need to know this stuff like the back of your hand. And I go, and the second half, I want it to be about you and your vision for the foundation and everything like that. So it took me two weeks to write. I turned it in. My rough draft was 40 pages. I got it down oh to, I got, yeah, I got it down to. I wouldn't I, have made it, Gary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got there it. Right. Once I stamped out that last paper in college, man, yeah. it was 
So I, pages? Well, I got it down. I wheeled it down to 18. Oh, and so the first nine gosh. pages were about him and his journey. And he had sent me some stuff on this and the foundation and the work they do. And the next nine were about me and everything like that. And then uh, the, I, so I sent it to the executive director. And then I also sent it for my parents, you know. And then uh, the executive director called me. She goes, I sent it to Gary. She goes, I just want you to know I read that. She goes, you, she goes I was crying, like, you know, all the oh. way through. You know? My parents read it. And then they're like. My mom goes, you need to read what you know, she was crying to. So then, so then uh, after that, Gary calls me up and he goes, uh, he goes, Hey Bill, I know you want to work here. He goes, I want you, I really, really want you to work here. And then he goes, you think you could be my speech writer? <laughs> yeah, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, well, uh, not the job you think you're going to get yeah. though. I need so, you to be yeah, the speech writer. That was one of my ancillary jobs. I tell you what, like, uh, I love like everyone that I wrote for him all the way up until the time I left was, uh. Uh, he loved, but it was one of the most nerve-wracking sure. things I had. Hey, you, I tell you what, done. when you're watching TV yeah. with the politicians, sometimes yeah. you, when someone has a good speechwriter, yeah, it's it, you can it's something. Yeah, because I, I he would tell me what he'd want in the speech, and and what he wanted it to be about, and everything like that. And then I put I put everything together, and I'd have to give it to him way beforehand because he could look at the whole first draft and be like, "Hey, no, no good, yeah. right?" And uh, and he's written plenty of his own speeches before, you know, but he's so busy. So then he would tell me everything that he wants to do, everything was about, and then I'd give it to him. And then I had to give it to him way before, so he had plenty of time to go through it and edit and everything. And that man, he would work on that uh, thing and all the way up until the time he went on the stage. Like one time, I was trying to find him right before he went on to tell me he's gone. He's not in like the green room or whatever he's gone. I finally tell him, he's like over the shoulder of the teleprompter guy. He goes, he's like, okay, there needs to be a comma here and a period here. And I was like, oh my gosh. yeah, and he's probably just read so much stuff, you know, and acting and everything. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And he, uh, and he was such a incredible person to work for. Every time I was around him, everything he did, he truly lives the example of, of his saying is, uh, uh, there, we can never do enough for our veterans, but we can always do a little bit more. And uh, I was just talking on the phone the other day with one of the GSF uh, representatives, and they're about to they're about to uh, dedicate their 91st home uh, to uh, wounded uh, to a wounded veteran, and they've done some for first responders. Those organizations do homes. Yeah, yeah they're awesome. That's pretty. It, that's it's good stuff. Man. It takes a lot, and what they do is they go into the neighborhood first, and they partner with people in the neighborhood and different groups and different things. And they have like a, a inspiration action dinner or whatever and get oh, everybody right. in the neighborhood that's, that's to come. Right so then they raise money out of the neighborhood and of course with our partners and everything like that with the people. But then that veteran gets to meet people there and everything. And then they're kind of like a little celebrity and then the people yeah. around the area. They got a veteran. In yeah, they, yeah, they know who they are. So when they're walking around town and everything like that. And, uh, and then it was just so special. And then working there, I got to know, you know, the families and everything that they were going through. And I got to know a lot of the different people and just some of the most... Here you have some of the most, you know, uh, some of the bravest men wearing the uniform, taking the fight to the enemy. And the next moment, they're some of the most helpless, right? And uh, and, and they're, you know, double, triple, quadruple amputees. You know, Mike Schlitz burned over 80% of his body, missing both his arms. You know, Travis Mills missing both arms, both legs. And then, uh, and then their stories uh, and yeah. their family stories of coming back through that, you know, and the people that come next, they're some of the most amazing and inspiring stories you can ever, ever hear, Yeah, you know? So that was How a great joy. How long did you do that job? So I was there, I was there for 18 months. And uh, I mean, when I, I remember when I first got there, I mean, I was all the time out, you know, um, cause if Gary was in one place, I'd be going to a different place most of the time to like talk to our different groups and meet with our veterans. I was at Walter Reed and Sam C and Balboa a lot. And then I was also uh, meeting with different donors and different things and working with the families. And then, uh, and then me and Gary would come together for some of the big events. And then most of that time I was Gary's bodyguard or I just happened to be in that role. I mean, I'll never forget Gary was getting his first award at the, that when I was there by the NDA, the, I think it's the National Defense Industrial Association. The only person that's ever received it that's not a senator or a general was Bob Hope. That uh, in he the deal. is yeah. our there Bob Hope. He is our Bob Hope. Yeah. So and that was the very first speech I had ever uh, written for him when he was going accepting that award. And then I remember, so we're all in Texas, and this is in D.C. at a really nice hotel in D.C. And then I remember, uh, this is I'm still in the reserves at this point, right? And so I remember there's all these three star and four. I had never been among around so much brass. Yeah, it's different, man, life. when they're all in the room dressed up. Right, because you know when an admiral comes on base, everyone's like... Everyone, everyone knows it. And everyone's like, like okay, like kind of like, you know, out of sight, out of mind, you know, just in case your uniform's a little bit off or something like that. So, like, now I'm around... And they don't know I'm in the military, but I'm just like... Uh, and Gary's there, 
And then suddenly, like, you know, all these three star and four star, two star and generals and colonels and everything, and, and their wives, and they're all decked out, gowns and everything, are trying to uh, meet with them. And then they kind of form a line uh, to start meeting with them. And then, and then uh, he has to go in to the thing. And then, like, you know, uh, he calls me Bill. He's like, Bill, uh, I need you to take care of this. And I'm like, I'm like, oh man, this can't, I, like, I'm going <laughs> to, I, like, this can't be good for my military career. Like, oh sir, my gosh. I, sir, I, <laughs> sir, I'm sorry. Did General, I, as you were. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Something <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah it was, like, like, I'm uh, sorry, sir. We, you know, we go. Da, da, da. And then uh, I saw one of them later, you know, like uh, in the hallway or whatever that were kind of like around there. And I, and I went up to him. I go, I go, sir, I apologize to you. I'm sorry. We had to get him in there. And he looked at me and he goes, he goes, don't even get a second thought. He goes, when I'm on base, I have to have people like yourself that, you know, sh shuffle me around and get me to the places I need to go. I was like, oh, thank God. So, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. That's stressful. Oh, it was stressful because I'd never been around yeah. that top of brass ever in my life. I don't know if cool is the right word to use for them, but yeah. they are mellow. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about like a real general. I yeah. understand around the, the things that you get worked up about. Right. Yeah. They don't, they're yeah. not. No, they're they're thinking on a whole different, a whole different level, man. Whole different and when they talk to you, you realize it. Yeah. They'll just, they'll say something yeah. that you're just kind of like, oh, yeah. I read that. Yeah. So that was, uh, and then, yeah, just working for Gary. I can't say enough wonderful things um, about Gary and, and the man that he is. Because when you work day in and day out with somebody, right? Like when we, like you and I and, all the guys we work with, like we all know each other's like good, bad, and ugly. I mean, Gary was just all heart and all drive. Uh, being, and his schedule was working different the weeks going that and doing his Lieutenant Dan Man concerts on the weekend and doing all those things. And he was just uh, an incredible, heartfelt, you know, person um, all the time and connecting with people and did so many things putting those things together, you know. And then I and I would just say, you know, keep Gary in your prayers. You know, he just lost his son, Mac. Yeah. You know, Mac uh, uh, had a five and a half year battle with uh, Cordoma. It's a rare form of bone cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, he has his own YouTube channel, Mac Sinise. He composed this beautiful music that he had been working on when he was in college. And uh, the year uh, before he passed, he brought it back out and partnered with some people. And you can go uh, listen to it on the Max and East channel on YouTube. It's some really beautiful co compositions. Um, Definitely pray him for him and his yeah. family. Yeah, keep his family in your yeah. prayers. Um, and yeah, so Gary was a great guy. And then after that, I just kind of fell backwards into what I do now, which is title insurance. Uh, no one ever grows up and goes, one day I'm going to be... Be an insurance salesman? Yeah. <laughs> I said, <laughs> said no one ever. I so, call people, like, you're not going to believe it, Wags, <laughs> you don't for a living. Like some of the guys, their jobs are phenomenal. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, what? Well, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> yeah. You're a freaking intern. Because yeah. I have visuals of you in my head when we've been in combat, where I was like, I would have never bought insurance. There's no way anyone would have insured us. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Point. Yeah. So it's. Uh, I work for the largest company in the country that does it. So we do uh, that does both residential and commercial title insurance, uh, fairly national financial. I primarily work under the Commonwealth brand. Um, I cover the whole country, coast to coast. Uh, I have some of the most amazing clients, amazing people. I mean, getting fun. So who are yeah. your clients? Title companies? No, no, they're uh, major REITs like real estate investment trusts. Some of the, you know, I've been very fortunate to work with some of the biggest real estate investment trusts in the in the country. And um, so they're they're people that um, are buying and selling like major industrial buildings. Like you know, you think about Amazon warehouses, or you think about, <clears throat> or you think about. Uh, major office buildings or uh, uh, major uh, malls or uh, stuff like that. That's all commercial real estate that's owned by some type of company, REIT, you know, private equity group. And so what I spend all my time doing is uh, going to visit them in whatever city they are, in the, usually in some major metropolitan city. So, so they're here. Will they call you? Like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm the oh, one. Oh, you got to hustle. I'm the one hustling, calling oh, okay, everybody okay. else. All yeah. right, roger that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like... Uh, and, and that's, and, and luckily, like when I first started this job, it was like, if you ever asked me what two years I would never want to repeat again, again in my life, it was my two years transitioning out of the military, basically a after the Gary Sinise Foundation into the private sector and starting from scratch at 42 years old, where most people are starting at 23, 24, what have you. And those years, because I, I wanted to have a job that I could that whatever effort I put into it, I could grow exponentially, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was no ceiling on it, yeah. you know? So I could, so even to this day, like if I land new, a new account, you kind of automatically promote, promote yourself if you land a new account. And so I thought like, okay, da-da. Now, 
it, it, it's just like a, a different mindset than I had in the SEAL teams. Like every morning that I woke up in the SEAL teams, um, you know, I felt like invincible. I felt like ready to grow, go intense and everything. And what's funny is like, you know, and I kind of, it, I loved coming to work. I love coming to work every day too, right? That, that was the that feeling you're talking about yeah. is real. Uh, I had that every when I got up. I was like, right, get to go into the team. Yeah. So then it was so funny because my very first day is a funny story that I was I did my initial training, and I was going to my first big conference where my management was going to be at, where there's going to be a couple thousand commercial real estate professionals that I could go meet and network. That none of them know me or anything like that. So my the guy who hired me, the president of our company, incredible man. He had got me these these tailor made suits, you know, so because I didn't have any suits or anything, you know, and so that were all way too tight. And I was getting in kind of like a I was like telling the guy who made them, I was like, these pants are too tight. And he looks at me and goes, if I make them any bigger, they're going to be clown pants. And I was like, I can barely move in these things, you know, and so <laughs> I, I like sitting down and standing up like, I'm, you know, don't want to rip my pants. And then and then the jackets were tight and then the uh, it's like the shirt, Hulk. Yeah, and so I was just like, yeah, I was like, so I was like, okay, well, this is what business people must do. They must go to work every, because I was always uncomfortable in the teams and the weather. And all. Business people go to work uncomfortable so they can just stay on that edge. Right? Getting, all these designer clothes are yeah. so uncomfortable. Yeah. That's why they work so yeah, hard. That's why they work so I didn't hard. know that. Yeah, it keeps them driving. Yeah, so I, so I show up uh, at the first thing and I'm like, Number one, I had been stuck in LA traffic for a long time. So now I'm like oh, yeah, all good, worked, good up. worked up. Yeah, good worked up because oh. I'm like, you know, I'm on my fourth monster and fifth coffee espresso. <laughs> You're in. Literally a Chris Bartley. Yeah. <laughs> so I come in there with a super tight suit and moving around and I get there to the management. I, I was a little bit late because I was in traffic. Now I feel really bad because you're never late in the military, right? And then I'm like looking around and I go, and I go, uh, and I ask them, I go, well, what, what's good to do? Because there's thousands of people around. They're talking, and it's between like a panel discussions. Like they'll do one panel, five or six people, for 45 minutes, take a 15 minute break. So the one panel was just ending the first panel of the day. And uh, and I go, I look at my manager, I go, what's good to do? And they go, well, it's always good to go talk to somebody who's on the panel. So that's all I had to hear, right? Now I'm in go mode, right? So there's probably a couple hundred people between me and the person on the panel in this huge auditorium. And uh, so I'm like looking around and I, I see this guy. Freaking monster yeah. staring at you. Like, I, I see this guy coming. You know I mean? uh, yeah, he had just got done speaking. He's on the panel, like talking to a few people that come up to him. Like, oh, you know, basically saying, I love what you had to say. He's like, oh, thank you. He's kind of, he has no idea I'm coming, right? Like, oh I, like, I'm, like I'm coming. Forehead and, sweating. Oh, you know, yeah. Mean? My way too tight suit. I'm making my way through yeah, the crowd. Too tight suit. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, waddling my way over there. And so... Uh, uh, I see him from a distance and uh, it's it's probably me and I'm probably about maybe 30 feet away at this time, like 10 yards or maybe a little farther, 12 yards away. And I was scared for whatever reason he was going to get away from me, right? Like, you know, merge into the crowd. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I was like, I go, I go, excuse me, sir. Like, the, and I didn't realize how loud I said, Oh my right? God. So like the closest 40 to 50 people. This is only people, take a second. Yeah. yeah. That one. Yeah. So the closest 40 or 50 people that were around me just stopped what they were doing. And I was like too like target focused to like yeah, yeah. kind of notice. And like, I go, and like people looked at me like, like with kind of like, like this. Yes, you know, and I go, no, not you, no, not you. I go, you, and the guy's like, me. <laughs> and I go, Takes off running, and I come up to him. I go, William Wagasey, Commonwealth Land Title. And I just remember him going, uh, uh, and he walked away, and he didn't even shake my hand. He might have ran. You know? Oh my god! I, I think someone was yelling. You know, uh, I think we got an active. You know, so like it was. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, so it was like, um, damn glad to meet you. Yeah, so, uh, and then I remember <laughs> so he, he, uh, he didn't, the first person in my life that had never shaken my Ghosted hand. You. Yeah, in it's a, different. Feels something. Yeah, yeah, feels, yeah feels. In, in a professional setting, right? Yeah, it feels but weird. I like, if I had a video of myself that day, I'd probably like, oh God. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. And I was just like, and I just remember like, I was being, I was like, I can't believe it. I didn't shake my hand. And my whole team, like, was just, laughing hysterically and like thank god my manager instead comes of over. being mortified oh yeah well i think there were a little bit of that too <laughs> and they were just like all right come over here sit down calm down a little bit right like catch your breath <laughs> <laughs> i know exactly what it looks like it's it's a monster in like, head. i know exactly what it yeah. looks like it's yeah so yeah funny oh man oh my god yeah so that was my first that's uh, what you tell everybody he didn't look like this <laughs> yeah. he looked different yeah it's my first 20 minutes on the on the actual operation of the yeah. job right so uh, where are you going <laughs> yeah don't so, leave yeah. Yeah. so yeah so then uh but but what happened was uh the the the, the great uh 
a fortuitous thing that I had happen to me was my first ever event that we had done at the Gary Sneeze Foundation was actually up in Dallas. And we were raising money for, at this really cool dinner for, uh, for a severely wounded veteran. And um, at the table at that dinner, unbeknownst, to, well, I didn't get a chance to talk to him because he's on the other side of the dinner. But he had heard me talking to the people that are around me and afterwards he asked me if uh, I was a former Navy SEAL. And he happened to know like a, a few of the people that we mutually knew mm. and stuff like that. And so, and so this man was trying to help people behind the scenes at GSF and never wanted like, you know, he was doing it all behind the scenes you know, working things. And, and so we'd get on the calls together and I just knew him as this incredible businessman from Dallas. I probably thought he was an oil or something. I didn't know. Right. And so oil was, and gas. oil and gas. Right. So what, uh, so then when I was leaving the foundation, um, out of all the people I knew, he was pretty much the only one outside the foundation. Uh, there were maybe a couple others that I gave a call to and I just called him up, you know, and I said, I go, Hey, I just want you to know that I think so highly of you. Thank you so much for, everything you've been trying to do at the foundation, I'm going to give you a warm handoff to the person that's taken over for me. And I just really appreciate you and everything that you've done. I thought this was going to be the end of it. Right. And so he says to me, he goes, well, what are you going to go do? I go, me, you know? And, um, I go, Oh, I go, I'm getting into commercial real estate. I go. And so like, I, I knew nothing about commercial real estate this time, but I was trying to explain it to him. I go, I go, so you know when someone buys a house? I go, that would be considered residential. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hell, it gets better. I go, now, and I go, if somebody buys a mall, I go, that would be a commercial property, right? Oh, my and God. So I kind of keep on going like this because I want to uh. sound whatever. So he stops me about 20 or 30 seconds, and thank God he did because I was just going down, you know, embarrassing myself. And he's like, He's like, Billy, don't do that. He's like, he's like, Billy. And I go, yes, sir. And he's like, I'm in commercial real estate. Yeah. I go, you are? So then I felt really stupid, right? So then he goes, he goes, So you understand what I've been saying there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you you get me, right? You understand yeah. my pitch. Yeah. How's it, was it going good? <laughs> yeah. So then I come to find out that uh I mean he had uh, he was running his own company at this time with a couple of his partners. But I come to find out that uh he had been the basically the president and the CEO of one of the largest commercial real yeah. estate REITs in the country, right? And then he had moved on to start his own company. And so he says to me, he goes, hey, do you have to uh, do some initial training? I go, yes, sir, I do. He goes, I'll tell you what. He goes, after you get through your training, you give me a week's notice. He goes, and then I want you to fly out to Dallas for two days. And I go, I go okay, yes, sir. So uh, so I uh, you know, did the initial training. Then I go, um, and at, at any point I thought like he would, you know, just like, oh, sorry, too busy or whatever. So I gave him a week's notice. He filled my, he goes, stand by. And the next, in the next couple hours, he filled my inbox with eight invitations. And he took two days off of work, walked me into every single appointment and did 90% of the talking. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that's how all my, that's how my business got started. That's how I landed my first big, uh, account in, in Dallas. Um, and, uh, and he's been one of my greatest mentors ever since in business. And in fact, when I first started, because in sales, you know, you're doing, especially when you don't know anybody, you're doing cold calls, yeah. you know, all this stuff. And no, most of the time, no one ever calls you back. Yeah. And so I remember I call him at least once a week because most of the time, no one ever called me back. And uh, I could not get off the phone with him without feeling 10 feet tall and bulletproof, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he kept me like going a lot. And then I remember, I remember the, 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 one of my biggest clients that's in Dallas, they, uh, had met with the CEO and he's like, okay, we're going to work together. Well, you know, like the commanding officer at your SEAL team, they say something and then you never really go and ask them again. Like, that's it. Like, right. You're, it's going to, and so, but then, you know, they have to find a deal for me. That's not already tied up with what I do and everything like that. So I thought after a certain time, like, um, you know, that they just forgot about me. And then my, Boss is like saying to me, like, hey, did you follow up with them? I go, oh, no. I go, you don't follow up with the commanding officer. I mean, you know, it's, you know, like, no, if they can't do it, they can't do it. If whatever, you know, that's it. And he goes, he's like, looking at me like, ah, oh, it's not how sales works here, buddy. You know, so um, I'm like, really? And he goes, he goes, yeah, you need to reach back out to him and stuff. And so, but they ended up being the first group, like, once they found a deal, we opened it. And it was the very first deal that I had ever uh, closed. And they've been one of my biggest clients ever since to this day. And then, and then from there, you, you get a couple wins on the board and then you, you know, build it. But still, in title for what I do, um, I, I, I can't live off one transaction or two transactions because with every transaction you make, you, you know, you're, you make so little money on each transaction that you have to have, I have to make my money on volume. Mm -hmm. So I have to have like 
a ton of clients across the country like to be able to uh, grow my business. Um, where sometimes like a commercial real estate broker might just be an office broker in Chicago and maybe do two huge office buildings for that year and be set, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, it just kind of started, um, you know, from there. And then I had a, I had a friend in, uh, I, I, and then from there I just kind of met people and some, and some just became like my huge allies. And in fact, if I was ever to like write a memoir or something like that, those are the people I would write about the people because they're my heroes because they're the people that gave me opportunity mm -hmm. and they didn't have to give it to me. And, uh, and you know, cause I can sit on the sideline and tell coach put me in, I'll do a great job for you all day long. And the coach might never put you in the game. And so for these people to like, Hey, wags, get in there, you know, uh, you're on for us. You're going to do this deal and work with us. Those are the people that changed my life in yeah. business forever. And, and then, and then it was probably five years in where I finally felt like, okay, I think I'm going to be okay. Right. Yeah. But it was, it took about five years to really, you know, feel like I was going to be okay. I mean, I had, sure. you know, and I had one friend that I hadn't talked to since law school, I'm sorry, since college, you know, and we were accounting majors together and, uh, and he works, uh, for this, uh, huge, uh, foreign company, um, in, uh, there. And I didn't know what the company was or anything. And he goes, uh, I, and he goes, Hey, why don't you come see me in New York city? When I came to see him, I hadn't seen him in 20 years, but once I found out what his company did, I was like working on what I'm going to say and everything like that. And as soon as I walked in, before I even said hello to him, he goes, wax, don't worry about, don't worry about the title. He goes, I'm the number two guy here. I control the title. He goes, I've already told everybody we're cutting you in. So what else is going on? Right. Oh so God, before sorry. I could even say hello to him, those, you know? are, the kind of, those are the meetings you want to have. Those, those are the you know, greatest be, awesome. business meetings ever. Like, ever. Hey, yeah. yeah. Taken care of. Yeah. Let's go do something else. Yeah. And with, and with him, I've, I've done, I did the largest single real estate asset in the history of the United States. And at the time at 50 Hudson Yards was a $3.9 billion project. And then, uh, and then I have just other ones in LA who works for another big REIT and other ones throughout now the whole country and major cities, uh, almost in, not in every metropolitan area, but in, in many of them yeah. that I have, I have met and uh, have just, you know, uh, gone. And then I work for the biggest company in the country that does it. So, you know, knock on wood, every time someone st puts us on the field, we're going to, we're going to crush it for them. And then, and then just like I always tell everybody, just like in the SEAL teams, how you have to earn your trident every day. I tell my clients, you know, because I tell my clients this too, I go, I go in my prospect, my prospects, I say, hey, in the SEAL teams, you got to earn your trident, whether you're going after a high value target, or you're just doing a uh, convoy to get resupply, right? Because you could get um, ambushed or That's whatever. Same thing. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Sa same intensity. And I, and I go, I have to earn your business every on every single transaction you give me. And not only on every single transaction, but on every part of the transaction. So on title, that'd be from opening the title to getting it, the, the preliminary title report turned around to working through all the performance to the underwriting to smooth clothing. Just, just like you have to earn your trident on every phase of mission planning and mission execution in the SEAL teams from, from like if you're planning- Start to finish. From start to finish. You're planning the med and where we're gonna have mass casualty or how we're gonna be medevac to the nine lines to everything, to the navigation, the sniper, to all of it from, from start to finish. That's how you have to earn it in business. And I tell every veteran that's coming out of the military and I tell everybody who's fresh out of college, and I learned this from, uh, a, a person said this to me who's a major principal now, CEO of a, of a huge uh, re. And he said, to, but at the time, he was like a senior managing director. He goes, and he told me, he goes, when I first worked here, he goes, I almost got fired. And uh, he goes, someone came to me and said, said, um, and I'll just call him like Joe. He says, like, he said, like, Joe, uh, getting a B here is the same as getting an F. He goes, you're in the real, real world now. Like, uh, if I can speak, uh, he goes, you're in the business world now, like you can't get a B or a B plus or even an A minus on any assignment we give you. You have to either get an A or an A plus. If you get an A minus on an assignment we give you with your quality of work, you're on the chopping block to be fired. Yeah, of course. You know, so, and I explain that to everybody that works with our team. I explain that to every veteran coming in. I, I explained this, I was just on the phone call with uh, one of my uh, clients' uh, sons, you know, about different things. I go, and because he wanted to talk to me because his grades were uh, uh, taking a little bit of a hit. And great kid, he's doing incredible things. You know, I was just talking to him about, you know, what you're after when you study. I go, you might never use this again, but really what you're after is the development of your mind. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the development of your problem solving and skills. Discipline to do it. Yeah, the discipline to do it, doing something that you, uh, uh, don't want to do, but getting it done, I go and I go and, and there's a little trick. The secret is just get started, right? Open that textbook, read the first line, 
right? Mm -hmm. And then if you got to go one minute on studying, one minute off, like it's a Tabata workout, then do that, Mm -hmm. right? Just like, or one minute on, take a 10 second break, read another minute of stuff. So, um, but I would tell everybody, you have to bring your A game on every single transaction that I do in the business world. And guess what that takes? That takes monumental effort, Mm -hmm. monumental effort and working through it because every deal has its own challenges, its own problems, its own issues. You know, I love the ones that go really smooth, you know, but you really earn people's businesses, uh, b- someone's business when it t- like there's some some problem you got to work through, mm-hmm. you know. So it's just that aspect and that keeps you moving. And I would say because uh, I'm on a plane, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, at a minimum twice, sometimes as many as four or five times a week and like what drives you? I'm like, oh. When you're on 100% commission, it's uh, fear and anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Fear and anxiety. Yeah, because if I'm not closing deals, I make zero dollars, right? Mm. So I have to constantly be working and closing. Well, we're so proud of That's you. That's good, Great job. Yeah. You, we're, your whole life circle is really yeah, awesome. Great, yeah, great, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. It's uh, It's been a joy. And yeah, and it's, it's just like looking back, you think about all the people that, you know, came into your life. And, you know, you guys, you all came into my life when I was just transitioning and, um, I mean, like for the Patriot tour and stuff and then everything that we went through in Mahdi. But I mean, you guys all helped me with that tr- transition, you know, because like after I was coming back from uh, Casco and stuff like that, like it's I always say like I remember someone said to me one time, someone said something like, oh, there people are going to be either doing stuff in science where people will be able to live to 150. And someone said, who well, we do? We really want to live that long. And I always say. You want to live as long as you always have something to look forward to, no matter what age you're at, right? And that's one of the biggest things that if you can add value to people, you can, and value could make you be making somebody laugh in a meeting. Like even when I go to somebody's office, I want to connect with that person when I'm talking. Mm -hmm. If I can make them laugh or tell a funny story or something, you know, something about funny. I always say like, you know, I was in the SEAL teams, all my buddies ran like gazelle, swim like dolphins and climbed the obstacle course like Tarzan. I did everything like a wounded elephant, right? Yeah. You know, I had one superpower in buds and that was taking the cold water because I was just fatter than everybody. You know? <laughs> so, uh, it's a great one to have though. Yeah, it's a great one to have. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, and then you, you just got to, you add value and, and, uh, and, but you guys were one of the first people that gave me something to look forward to, right? You know, so, and that's, that's a big thing. Like people underestimate the power of that, right? But um yeah, that was a great joy. I remember going on Patriot Tour with you guys, and that was so exciting. We it was loved, a blast. It was so it. much fun. We loved oh, you rock, being rock part tour, of it. Right? Yeah. Great. <laughs> loved you being all a part old, of it. All the yeah. cities, all the old theaters. Yeah. Playing. Yeah. Good, man. It's job, so brother. crazy yeah, to think you. of what everybody's doing now that was on Patriot Tour. Like Goggins is so oh my God. He blew bigger up, than didn't life. He? I hate I'm proud of him. Yeah. Man. yeah. And Taya's, you know, in She's, such a good place. And yeah. her kids, you know, her son Colton is running American Sniper brand. Oh, really? Yeah. Good for him. And um Chad Fleming's doing he's doing uh commercial real estate stuff i oh, think really? he's doing like to. mortgage mortgages stuff. and stuff yeah uh, but yeah it's just really neat to see scobell's kids he's doing great yeah they're doing great yeah mary sarah's a uh remember she used to sing the national anthem oh yeah he's doing uh she's a country music star in nashville oh really yeah, yeah. that's awesome man yeah yeah, it really is oh, amazing. Right. I forgot yeah. about the bus. Remember that double deck? Was it a double decker bus that we had that one time? We had time? one going from. Uh, <laughs> you know, Goggins ran to every city and oh, state. So you know ride with to San Antonio. He, so I have so many people that I've met in the professional world. Uh, you'd be surprised that I have found out that we're either struggling maybe with something in their life. Like maybe it could have been. I mean, they were productive members of society, but maybe they're struggling with an addiction of alcohol awesome, or yeah. something like that. And uh, I know, some. yeah, and I know I know this one person who um, they just got into their office and would listen to Goggins and work on themselves and get into this mental state, and that's mm-hmm. how they beat it, you know. Yeah. And uh, I know another person uh, that I served with uh, that was a higher ranking person, and like he reached out to me just randomly, like on uh, I forget if it was uh, Facebook or something. He's like, he goes, Wags, he goes. Uh, I dropped like, you know, 60 pounds. I just listened to Goggins and I just got up and I started doing everything because, you know, he, you know how you get beat up and we, I mean, we can all be like, oh, my knee yeah. hurts, this hurts, that hurts, whatever. And I do a thing and just, I would say like, just do whatever you can do, right? Yeah. But Goggins, he's inspired a lot of people. A lot of people that you might not think he's I like, know. like professionals. It's and, incredible what yeah. he has become. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to be his friend. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. I still talk to him. Oh, yeah. do you? Yeah. Oh, of course. I keep in touch with all everybody. He was, uh, I'll never forget on a Patriot tour, like 
rain, shine, whatever. He would get up in matter. the morning. And I run. It was like miles. running like, yeah, like 10, 12, 16 miles. We would have to map 50. out our route. He oh, run 50, 50, 50 miles. miles. We would have to map out our route times based on if he would have enough time to run beforehand. Oh, my gosh. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's like. I don't know what he's yeah. going to do <laughs> when he has to stop running. Uh, yeah. I don't know. He'll get on like. Yeah, because, I mean, that's a lot of running. That's a lot of running. There's yeah. going to have to be a machine that can, like, move his legs. Well, yeah. Or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his muscle revolt. Yeah. 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 Hey. Cause I know, yeah, because I think he just went through, like, a knee surgery or something like that. Uh, I don't know. But, yeah. We love you, Goggins. Yeah. yeah. Good job, Incredible. All right, All right, man. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, really? thank you guys. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. Don't buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs>